this happened in November uh, of 1997. It was during deer season. It was high power rifle season. And uh, the night before, I had planned to go deer hunting the next day. And you just have to know uh, who I am as a hunter and everything I do in life. I'm just a uh, 110% type person, you know, whether it's four wheelers, uh, you know, collecting cards, coins, whatever it is. I'm just, uh, I, I give 110% to everything I do. But uh, I decided to go deer hunting the next day. And I go, I went ahead and got everything lined out. And, uh, I'm known where I'm from by people just for the fact that I, I'm able to kill big deer and I don't really do anything special besides hunt the deer. Everybody now rides four wheelers rather than walk and hunt. They ride their four wheeler to their tree stand, they get off again their tree stand, and then they leave and ride home, you know. But me, I leave the house on foot and I come back on foot. So I, I kind of walk, hunt. Uh, I cover a lot of ground. I've learned how to track. I've learned how to. Uh, I've just learned how to 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 hunt deer. You know, that's what I that's what I was doing. I had the bug at the time, so that's was just my thing. You know, some people fishing, whatever. Mine was hunting and fishing and stuff, of course. But uh, at this time, it was deer season, so I was dedicated. And I usually hunted, uh, if not two or three times a week. You know probably more, but I got ready. My dad was supposed to go and, uh, I got up late and, uh, he was still there too. He didn't get up either. I slept, you know, 15 years old. I didn't have to get up. So I didn't, but, uh, usually I would, but this morning I didn't, I slept in. It was a jury day. It just, it was the, the skies were gray and you just to know where I'm from in Eastern Kentucky, the sun comes up at 10 o'clock and it goes down at three. And that's not a lie. I'm dead serious. I live in between two mountains and these are straight up and down. There's really high pitch on them. But uh, I got up late and uh, I debated on whether to go or not still. You know, it was around 12, I believe, 11, 12 o'clock. And uh, I sat around forever uh, debating on whether or not to go. And then I finally talked myself into it. And I got everything together and uh, I headed out. And uh, I went up to normal place that I I went, but when I got up to the top of the mountain, I was like, well, I said, I'm going to try going out this way. I had never went that way before, at least not deer hunting that year. So uh, I decided, you know, what the heck? And I took that little trail around through there and uh, I got out there. It was probably about three. I think it got dark real kind of early like 4 45 5 o'clock or something but it was around three i sat around and dozed off up against a tree just you know sleeping in and out and then i, I realized it's getting late i'm gonna have to get out of here because i knew it would take me longer than an hour to walk home from where i was at so uh i got up took probably maybe 15 steps maybe and uh so like something hit me just like somebody hit me, smacked me in the face with uh, fear. And it was, I, can't, I can't even explain the level of fear that it, it uh, instilled in me. And that's one of the questions that I have now is how and why. But, yeah, I stopped and paused and stood there for what felt like an eternity. Like the whole situation felt like an eternity. But... Everything that happened just kind of was was slower in reality. It probably was only 30, 40 seconds, if that. But I stood there and I just moved my eyes. I didn't move my body or not because I knew the silence that I was hearing. And I also was hearing silence. Nothing. It was just like that buzzing that you hear in your ears sometimes. Like I've heard silence before, but this was something else. And uh, I just scanned the forest. And on my way back with my eyes to my right, I caught something moving and it was about anywhere from 50 to 70 yards i would say but it was moving from my right to my left and it was a black a black blob uh it was so black that it didn't look like it had any other color hair on it at all and i don't think that it did it was just a shiny black and uh I couldn't make out what it was. I don't know whether it was just my my head wouldn't make out what it was. My eyes, I just couldn't put it together. But uh, like I said, it was moving right to left, and it was 
swinging its arms. It had its hands up, but I could see its elbow. That's the first thing that I noticed was its elbow. And uh, once I seen its elbow, I noticed that it had a chest. Like I could see its chest from the side, from a side profile. And its face, uh, its, its snout was looking away from me. It never, it never made an attempt to turn around and look at me. Uh, it just walked at a steady, like a slow pace, like it wasn't in a rush. It wasn't worried about me. I just stood there and followed it with my eyes. And it probably took me half of this thing's journey. And through my visual eyesight to figure out what I was looking at. And uh, it had a tail that almost drug the ground, but it had a curl to it. Solid black. Everything was solid black. It had haunches and everything. And, and I, my eyes, I'm just putting this together as this thing's walking away. My heart's pounding. I've got a lump in my throat and uh, I'm just in shock. I didn't know what I was looking at. It, it was, it was very intense. Uh, just a very intense. Conf- it wasn't a confrontation. It was just a very intense uh, visual, you know, just to see this thing, how massive it was. It, it was, it was truly something I, I don't. I don't even know what category to put it in. I don't think there is one. Very shocking. After I stood there for about, it's really hard for me to to call time on this <laughs> because everything felt like an eternity. But I'm sure it was only less than you know. The whole thing was less than a minute, a minute and a half at most. But after this thing left, it went right out of sight. I don't know if it because we were standing on top of a mountain on a ridge line and the ridge dipped down kind of like, I guess it would look like a, what they call a gap, you know, where you can cross over into another holler and remain low. You don't have to, you know, a predator won't take a ridge. They won't allow their self to be in the ridge line. So you can see them. So they'll, they'll stay low and take those gaps and stuff. And that's what it did. I don't know if it dropped down to all fours, when it rounded, you know, the little space I had to see it in, which was probably about 50, 60 yards, about the same distance from me to is about how far it had to go before I would have lost sight of it. And uh, it dropped down. I don't know if it dropped down off words. I'm assuming that's probably what it did uh, as it went over the hill. But that's what it looked like to me. But uh, it, it was a very... Uh, a, a very intense feeling and sighting, like a nothing. He never did look at me. He never did acknowledge me, but I knew, I knew that it knew I was there. And uh, now that looking back on it, I think neither one of us knew each other was there. We would have crossed paths, like just looking at, uh, you know, in my head, looking at how we were walking and, you know, we would have crossed paths. We literally would have bumped into each other. So I think it stopped me. So it could go. And uh, I never got the feeling that that creature uh, was from there. I never got the feeling that it lived there. But you got to think, I was I was a little ways away from my home. You know, when I hunted, I would go. I was young. It didn't bother me. I would just walk just to see what I could see. It, and when I went home that day, uh, I couldn't have went home any faster. You know, I, I went home quick because I, I wanted to tell somebody. I couldn't wait. But uh, I made it home. And uh, I told my dad about it, and they laughed at me. Him and his friend that was there at the time, they laughed at me. So I was like, yo, you know, whatever. You're old. You know? and so I, I told one of my friends. He didn't believe me either. So that kind of put a bad taste in my mouth for the way people was acting about it. And I just knew that nobody was going to take it serious. Nobody was going to believe what I No matter what I did, they wasn't going to believe me. Yeah, Vic, it was just a very intense, emotional ride, just seeing that and then having to come off that mountain, you know, looking over your shoulder the whole time. I I come off that mountain so fast. I had a shotgun with slugs. You know, I was, of course, deer hunting and where I'm from, you know, a high powered rifle isn't much good. Everything you're going to shoot is probably going to be a brush shot. 
because I was young and poor and I didn't have no tree stand. I never really built one. I kind of, like I said, I just walked and hunted. So that's what I did. And nothing that ever happened to me in my life would have led me to believe that, uh, you know, and I had heard of Bigfoot before, but never researched it, never watched anything on it. Nothing, just uh, maybe a book or something in the library when I was a kid. But other than that, I just never, uh, it never hit my radar, man. Nothing did. Nothing about Dogman did even after that uh, for a long time. The, even the term Dogman is only two or three, four years old to me. But that's the uh, the first encounter. My second encounter, I didn't get a visual on it, but me and Kurt, we have some trail cameras, but we have one down here near my home in a preserve. I had recently started getting tracks out of there, and uh, I don't know if it correlates. Some people say it does, but I don't know if it does or not. I don't know if these creatures are capable of following you home or not. I've heard a lot of stories that they can. But uh, now this preserve is a place that I would go with my daughter all the time because she uh, she knows about this, and uh, she knows what I do. She loves it too, but I try to keep her – you know, on the safe end of things. And I try to take her hiking and keep her outdoors. And I try to make her know to always keep her eyes open. And I, I try to teach her just safety when you're in the woods altogether, whether it be with a gun with, or without one, just hiking. But I've also taught her to not go into the woods without a gun. So, and I don't myself, but uh, I decided to go out there. I, I normally don't go alone. But this day, I just decided, well, I'm just going to run out there and grab that SD card. I'm really not going to do anything. I'm just going to switch the SD cards, and then I'm going to come back. But, but I got out there. I got out of my car. It was a normal day. There was no uh, nothing out of place. Actually, there was a little noise going on this time. There's really not ever a, a noise down there, but there was some birds chirping and stuff. It was, it was a fairly nice day. And uh, I got out to where my camera was. And I reached over and clicked it off and took my SD card out, switched it out for the one that was in the camera. And uh, I put everything back up, turned it back on. And I stood up for a second. I was like, well, I think I'm just going to go on down this trail and then I'll just come out on farther down the hiking trail. Because I don't ever mess around. There's a part of the preserve that has a hiking trail on it. Okay, so but but the part we stay on or or we're researching and a lot of the tracks that we've got has actually come right off of the trail. Uh, You know, there's I've got so many, but I I won't cast one that I think that can be a domestic dog, even though I've not seen anybody down there with a dog. You know, this is a small preserve. Not many people know about it, but. uh, I decided to, like, make a big. uh, like a horseshoe, you know, and come back to the car. I wanted to just go down there and check some things out. See, maybe I might run across some tracks, you know, where uh, I think it had rained the day before, maybe. And I was just looking for tracks. And I took, I probably got about 40 yards from my trail camera. And I wasn't moving fast. I was just taking my time and walking and looking. And uh, I I heard a dog bark. The layout of the land where I was at is – kind of thick it's got briars a lot of briars and there's a lot of that yellow like hay looking stuff and it looks like deer have been bedding down uh like a real bad you know i'm, I'm sure everybody knows what i'm talking about but uh you could tell that it was matted down in a lot of places now i don't know if it was deer that done all that or what it looked that way but i i was standing there and i heard a dog bark and it was just coming from my left as i'm walking uh, and I turn and face that direction as soon as that dog barks because it's so loud and, and intense sounding. You know, the, the bark's just real loud. And it barks a couple times and it stops. And then I hear it again. It barks again and it's closer. Okay, it stops and it does barks again. It's closer. Now, I could tell that this thing was coming toward me. I couldn't hear it. I don't know if it was making noise or not, but, you know, I was focused on the sound. Uh, and the first thing that hit my mind was, there was a hiker down in there, and that's its dog. I don't. I didn't want. To, I had a twelve gauge with me, and I had slugs, but uh, I didn't want to shoot nobody's dog. That was the first thing that hit my mind. It wasn't dog man, which should have been, but uh, that wasn't the first thing that hit my mind. I don't know why, but I panicked 
uh, I sure did. I panicked and I tried. I, I seen this tree to my left and it was a small tree, probably six inches thick. And it had briars all over it. I mean, big long was an inch long. I tried to hit that tree, man, and it tore me up. Like it tore my hands up, my arms. I got big thorns in my head still right now. I got thorns in my head that we've uh, not been able to get out. But uh, after trying to get into that tree before it felt like forever, I finally just said, whatever. And I turned around with my gun and I got in position and I was just waiting for this thing to bust through the brush right and it had to come about 20 yards once it come out of the tree line in the thick brush. It would have had to have come about 20 more yards to get to me. And uh, I was just standing there waiting and nothing happened. It went dead silent. Nothing. I didn't hear nothing leave. I didn't hear, you know, it wasn't growling. It wasn't doing anything. It was just dead silent. Uh, I stood there for probably what felt like an hour, but I really didn't stand there probably five to 10 minutes at most before I decided to try and make my way back the way I had just came, tried to loop around and get out of there real quick. But I thought, well, I'll get back to my car and I'll find out who's down here with their dog. And I get back out and there's nobody there. There's no other cars in the parking lot and it's just me down there. So uh, no doubt these things, uh, probably, whatever that was, probably got a good kick out of, of what it did to me because it scared me. Me and Kurt have had a, a few different experiences out in the field, and, and a lot of them are just, you know, it'll be an intense smell or uh, just an intense feeling of some kind that they, these things will. I will be doing something like, uh, for example, uh, when we get out there, there's this little wash in the area that we're going to, and I, I didn't know this at the time, and I walked down in there, because I had got a dog man on in, in a picture and I was just curious as how that creature got all the way up as big as it was, got all the way up there as quietly as it did. You know, we didn't hear nothing because we were being really quiet. And uh, I walked down in there the next time we went, you know, of course, and, uh, there's a wash there that's about 10 inches wide, I'd say. And it washes all the way down to a creek somewhere down in there. But, uh, I walked down in there and Kurt stayed at the top. He was doing some filming off back up behind us because we had a lot of activity on this day. Uh, there was a lot going on. You know, they were, they, I think there were some people out there on some horses maybe, but uh, they just passed through and went on. You know, they didn't hang around the area. You know, there was just a horse trail that went through there. But I was down in this holler now and I, I just got intrigued with the tracks since I started getting these casts, I just finding these tracks are just one of the main sources of evidence that we have to show a large canine bigger than any domestic or even wild dog could be, could make a track this big. They're just, it's just not possible. So I got intrigued and there was just so much soft ground there and, and clear spot for a track to be that I just had to look, you know, and before I knew it, you know, I was, I don't know. I was probably 75 yards from Kurt down in there by myself. And uh, I first got this intense smell. And the only way I can explain it is, uh, is if you've ever been around a, like, a, like a dead deer, you can smell uh, the wild fur smells. You can smell it. And that smell just became so thick in the air. You know, I could smell. It's all I could smell. Yeah, I guess the, it was just their, their body odor. I had You know, dog man is the only thing I can attributed to but just being their body odor uh, it didn't really stink it was just a uh, wet animal smell real thick and uh now in this same location there's rock cliffs that start you can see a huge rock sitting there down the hill to the left and i knew from the activity that we were getting there had to be a den or some kind of place for them to stay nearby just or i was assuming that there was I went down in there and uh, Kurt hollered at me and he said, you know, Kurt didn't want me to go down in there by myself. So I kind of stopped and, but I wanted to get a look at this rock. I, I, I thought maybe where that rock had had an overhang. I thought maybe, you know, something had made some tracks underneath there. So uh, I get down there and I get about 20 yards from it. And uh, 
something growled or I mean, it sounded like a growl to me and it sounded very, uh, very guttural, very, uh, don't come any closer. <laughs> That's what I got. And when I hollered at Kurt and said, did you hear that? Kurt's like, yeah, you should probably get up out of there. So I turned around and uh, I didn't run, but I made my way back up the hill. But I'm about 95% sure it was a, it was a really, uh, because it came from the other side of the rock. I don't know if it just didn't want me to come around that rock unless there just wasn't anywhere for it to go. But on this day, we had got a lot of stuff on camera. We had been hearing a lot of sounds from this very area that I was in, but we just hadn't went down in there. Uh, but on this day, I did. I made my way down in there. Later on, I've been back down in there, and I ended up finding a, uh, a huge vertical straight up and down crack in a rock that stands about 30 feet tall. There's a crack that's wide, probably about 24, 25 inches wide, and it goes back into the rock. It just splits the rock, and you can go back. I could have went in there if I wanted to. You know, I could have turned sideways and weaseled my way back in there. I would never would, but and I have a I have a 4K camera with night vision on it, so I stuck it back in there. I, I really couldn't make anything out, but uh, that no doubt is where the growl was coming from that I heard. And I probably would have seen that had I rounded the rock that day. But since then, I've gotten dog man on camera down in there in the same spot. I firmly believe that that is something that they use and somewhere they stay because it goes back in and curves to the left. You can't see what's in there. You can just see the curve where it goes around. And you can see where the ground is war going back in there. Now, I could be wrong. It could be or whatever. But... Given the stuff that we've got on camera, I firmly believe that it's a uh, den or something that they're using or something that some wild animals using right there. There's tracks there, but there's so many tracks that you just can't discern what's what's what going or coming. But uh, that's uh, really the only intense encounters that we've had or that I've had. I mean, you know, the growling. But, you know, nobody was there but me to hear it. So, you know, to me personally, that don't it just don't carry much weight. But just things like that's going to happen. I know I know it is, you know, me sticking my nose in that kind of situation, so to speak. So, I mean, I expect as much to get growled at, maybe barked at or run off. Before we move on, if you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, either way is fine, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. We were talking about the strip mine property up behind our house, and one thing that I, I didn't mention earlier was years ago, uh, my husband and his ex-girlfriend were driving through that area, and they were coming down the hill from the strip mine area and they actually had four or five we he he doesn't know of these large black dog-like creatures that actually chased them there were some on her side of the car there were some on his side of the car he said their their eyes had this real amber glint to them or glow to them and they chased them down this hill for probably a good quarter of a mile before they they veered off it's a one lane curvy road, so they couldn't go very fast on the road. And these things literally would like run up to the, the doors and then they would back off and then they run up to the doors and they back off. And he said it was really creepy. He, he wasn't scared, but he said it was just a really creepy experience having, you know, these big dogs chasing them. He said they definitely were not domestic dogs or coyotes or anything like that. You know, he's very much a woodsman. He's much more of a woodsman than I am. And he definitely knows the difference between a, a dog, a koi dog, a domestic dog, whatever. And he said these things were huge and they just, you know, kept pace with the car. They were probably going 25, 30 miles an hour and they easily kept pace with the car. He said that he believes that they actually could have outpaced the car, but they, they wouldn't go in front of the headlights to where he could get a good look at them. So that, again, ties back into that, that strip mine area. But there was a whole pack of those. That I probably would have really not been able to get over. 
some of my other sightings I've, I've done a little better with, but I, I don't know if I'd see, if I had seen a pack of them that I would ever want to come back out to this place where we live now ever again. And even when he told me about it, it creeped me out for a while, but, you know, I just put it out of my head. I didn't experience it. So, you know, I just kind of let it go. Then we were coming down that, that same area and this was about four years ago. And there was one, it was tall and grayish, it was about two o'clock in the morning and it was tall and kind of gray and our headlights hit it. And it just kind of stepped out of the tree line up to the edge of the road. Now, this one was really weird. It looked very emaciated, almost like it had mange or something. It was a really weird looking dog man. I think that was the first time I had ever seen one. And it was just like for just a couple seconds to the point where I literally convinced myself that it was my imagination, that I hadn't seen anything that I didn't see it. It wasn't there. And this was before I'd I'd seen a Sasquatch or anything else. And so again, it was one of those things that, you know, I filed in my head and just kind of put away and then forgot about until you and I started talking and all these memories start coming back to, well, there was the one that you saw that time. And it was like, well, did I see it? Did I not see it? And when you only see them for a second, it's easy to, to logic them away and convince yourself that you haven't seen one. And I think for, you know, me at the time, it was the healthier choice was no, that was just my imagination because, you know, just the concept of a werewolf or again, now that I understand that they're dogmen, I I would have been, you know, quite terrified to have seen what I saw that night. But over the course of time, and this happened after 2019, I think was when I saw the, the first Sasquatch and it was like I I became more aware and more attuned to paying attention to the noises in the woods. And, you know, I'm familiar with bobcat calls and fox calls and and the various noises in the woods. I've never been afraid of the woods, you know, at night, but there's a, a weird feeling that you get when a cryptid's around, whether it's a Bigfoot, whether it's a dog man, it's, it's a, it's a strange feeling. You know, the the air feels heavier and you feel like you're being watched. It's a very odd sensation. So we've been hearing over the past few years, about four years now, howls, tree knocks, grunts, even the samurai speak and things of that nature. But it's very obvious when you hear a squatch or a, a booger make a, a long howl versus the dog man howls. Now we do have dogs in the neighborhood and we have, you know, some border collies and they like to howl, but it's a totally different sound. These howls that we hear are very deep. They, they actually, you know, kind of resonate in your chest. You can feel them as much as hear them. And there's been some times that we've heard howls and it's, it's kind of creepy to go outside after dark. We've put up motion security lights after, you know, the Sasquatch sighting. We, we put up a lot of uh, motion security lights and there have been times that we've gone out and these lights have been turned around to actually face our house instead of facing out into the yard or the backyard or the tree line or whatever. And a lot of these lights are anywhere from seven to 10 feet in the air. You know, we have to get a ladder to actually move them and you have to basically take a screwdriver and loosen them to actually turn them back around or, you know, it takes, you know, somebody with my husband's strength to turn them back around. So we have a lot of raccoons and things of that nature. And if they were climbing up and, and, you know, hitting the lights or something, they would not have the strength to actually turn these things completely around 180 degrees. We put out trail cams. That was another thing after my Bigfoot encounter that, you know, you had talked about was they seemed to not like the trail cams. So we put out some trail cams And there was one night, we have them set to video so we can capture things more than just pictures. And there was one night uh, we got a video of the the trail camera literally being shaken back and forth and then flipped upside down. It wasn't pulled off the tree that we had it, but it was literally turned upside down. So again, a lot of weird things like that, that I don't know, is it a Sasquatch? Is it a dog man? Just a lot of strange occurrences around our property. But this isn't the only property that we've lived on that we had experiences with dog men. For a while, we lived in Georgetown, Kentucky, which is just outside of Lexington. And it's an absolutely stunning little town, nice suburbs, you know, nice, nice neighborhoods. And we had a townhouse in that area. And 
so James had gone out, my husband, James had gone out to go to work one morning. It was probably about five o'clock in the morning. It was still dark outside. And there was literally a dog man standing right in front of his car. Uh, he said this thing was probably seven and a half, eight feet tall. And it stared at him. He stared at it. He has no idea how long that he stood there looking at this thing. And my husband, being the, the man he is, who is extremely brave with most things in life, just goes over and gets in his car and leaves. Now, I wish he'd come back in and told me that there was something out there, but he didn't. I was still asleep and he didn't want to wake me up. So he just told me about it later. And then we were out the very next day doing some things in the yard. And I looked up because our, our yard sloped really harsh in the back of the, the townhouse. It wasn't completely underground. And so I looked up probably, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 feet in the air where the siding started on the, the townhouse. And there were scratches that had actually scratched through the siding on the side of our townhouse. Now that creeped me out really, really bad. But again, I didn't see it. And it, I just kind of, again, filed it away as, you know, okay, we got something around here. But after that, we didn't have any more incidents that we can remember in Georgetown. Um, it was just that that one morning and then the scratches on the side of the townhouse. So getting back to our property here, again, we've seen the Sasquatches here and then we've seen, you know, the dogmen. Now, with dogmen, again, for the longest time, I refer to them as werewolves. The ones that we've seen very much look like the werewolf out of Van Helsing, you know, with the, the, the dog legs, the weird elongated hands that, you know, they, they kind of hold up. They look like raccoon hands. The long snouts, you know, more like a German shepherd type snout. And then the, the pointed ears. Very piercing eyes. I think that's the one thing with my encounters that I think have been the most intense is just how piercing their eyes are. It's like they're looking through you. And with any predator, you, you kind of have that, you know, where they really are looking at you and studying you. But there is something just beyond terrifying when you look a dog man in the face. And that was the reason that I, I reached out to you. I've seen snippets and things that I thought were dogmen, but the reason I reached out to you for some help and reassurance and advice was a, a very specific event that actually happened just a few weeks ago. And again, going back to the fact that it was beyond terrifying. I, I can't, I, I, I cannot emphasize that enough. We were preparing to uh, go out of town. We we do a medieval recreation thing where, you know, we dress up in medieval clothing and go play war games. And it's it's a lot of fun. But we were going to it was it was probably three hours away. And I am a very. Well, I should say I'm very much not a morning person. And so to get up really early in the morning, I normally just stay up all night long because I'm much more active. I do a lot of my work at night. So if I'd have gone to sleep that night, it would have been noon before I got up. So I needed to get something out of my truck and our outdoor lights, they're battery supplied. We don't have them hardwired in our outdoor motion sensor lights. And we hadn't changed the batteries for a while. So there wasn't a whole lot of light outside. and. So I kept waiting for the sun to come up and then it got to where I just, I did not have any more time. I had to go get this to be able to prep for our out of town trip. So I grabbed the flashlight that was on the desk beside of me and I go outside. And of course I grabbed the one flashlight that the batteries were dying in. And so this flashlight was awful and I could barely see with it. I could see enough, you know, it gave me a little bit of light, but this thing normally, you know, you get a good 20 foot worth of light. And I had maybe, you know, five feet of light in front of me. And so I go get in my truck and I had to get like three or four things and I'm juggling these things in my hand. And so the flashlight's hanging by my arm by the lanyard and it's swinging because, you know, I'm moving so much. The, the flashlight is swinging. And all of a sudden I, to my left, I see I shine. Well, given the fact that we have foxes and coyotes and raccoons and deer and different things like this, I wanted to make sure that the eye shine wasn't something that, you know, like a, a coyote 
that was going to be a problem. And so I jiggle the stuff around in my hands and I'm able to, to get the flashlight off of my left arm and I, I pull it up and I shine it up into the woods because our, our driveway is right up against the tree line. And it, then it goes for acres and acres and acres, possibly a couple miles worth of nothing but woods behind our house. And what I saw was beyond incredible. I. Again, my flashlight, maybe five, maybe eight feet tops was was how far that the flashlight was shining out. So this thing was five, maybe eight feet away from me. And it was a dog man. You know, I, I saw the pointed ears. That was the first thing. And the eye shine, um, very amber eyes. And this thing is just staring at me. It was it was a strange experience because, you know, I'm standing there and I literally am doing the deer in the headlights. I cannot move. I can't drop what's in my hands. Um, normally, if I go outside after dark, you know, I, you know, I wear a, a pistol. I didn't have a pistol on me. Um, even if I did, I probably wouldn't have thought at that point to even think about grabbing it. And it probably would have been the worst thing I could have done, honestly. But I'm looking at this thing and it's staring back at me. And again, five, maybe eight feet tops. This thing is away from me. It's up the hill just a tiny bit. So trying to estimate the size of this thing, I'd say maybe seven feet. And that is a really, really random guess on my part. And I, I apologize for that. But it turned its head just slightly. And I could see it had this very long snout. And it wasn't a big turn. It wasn't like it was looking away from me. It was like it kept its eyes on me the entire time. But, you know, it turned just enough to where I could see the snout. And then it turned back and looked at me again. And all I could think of is this thing could reach out and, and just grab me if it wanted me. And I, I, I don't know how to express the terror that I felt at that particular moment. I mean, I, I was literally I, I could not move at all um the the truck was still unlocked i could have you know jumped in the truck i could have ran in the house which probably would have been bad you never run in front of a predator so i just stood there and you know i had the, the flashlight shining in its face and it's just again it's just standing there looking at me and i don't know what to do and all i could think was i remember when we were talking about sasquatches i could hear your voice in my head going if it wanted to get you it would already have been on top of you or whatever. I can't remember exactly what you said because all this, this memory is kind of flooding back right now. And all I can think about is just how terrified I was at looking at this thing straight in the face. And then it was really strange too, because it made a movement with its head that looked, you know, in my, my terrified logic brain, it looked like it nodded at me. Now, I don't know that they nod, so I'm, I'm not making a speculation of that they nod, but that's what it felt like. Like it was, I don't know, that it, it was like it wasn't there trying to scare me. It was just, I just happened to catch it in the flashlight. And if I hadn't, I wouldn't have even known it was there. And so, again, my, my terrified logic brain went to, it nodded at me to let me know everything was okay. And then it turned and just walked off. And about a minute later, I heard the dogs, the neighbor's dogs, just absolutely going crazy barking. So I'm assuming it went over past the where the dog kennels are at our neighbor's house. But Vic, I mean, I, I really can't emphasize enough. I mean, this this was it was beyond terrifying. I, I, I don't even know what to say other than I never want to go through that again, ever. So there was another incident where, you know, how we, we've talked about it and I've, I've heard stories about, you know, that they they like to scare people and whether it's psychological or a threat or whatever. I, I don't know. I don't know enough about them to say what it is. But I was going through the hallway one night and this was a time when we'd been hearing howls and walking through the woods. And I think it was actually shortly after James had seen the one when he was going out to the, the garbage that night, but there was a, a tapping on the back window and it wasn't back door, excuse me. And it wasn't like somebody knocking on the door. It was literally, it sounded like a claw tapping, just a single claw going tap, tap, tap. And it was very rhythmic. And I, 
didn't turn on the light. I didn't look at it. I just kept going in the direction that I was headed. And I was like, if, if that is a dog, man, I don't want to know. And I don't want to incite it. I don't want to cause any more problem. If it's just tapping, then tap away and go away. <laughs> it's kind of the, 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 what I was thinking at that particular time. But that, that was extremely creepy. When they mess with you, that's just something, again, ugh. And then shortly after that, James was outside one day, and there was one, he'd gone out to the porch, and again, this was at, after dark, it was about 8 p.m. wintertime, and there was one literally standing in the middle of the yard just looking at him, and he just backed into the house, and he could see, you know, the hawks, he could see, the, the, it kind of had a, a short, bushy tail, he said the thing had to have been eight feet tall, if not taller, just literally standing right in the middle of the yard, just looking up at him. It Again, that's one of those things where with, you know, what my experience was with, you know, looking at this thing eye to eye, I don't know how he was able to continue going outside after dark. But again, he really has very little fear of anything. Snakes. He's afraid of snakes. But other than that, <laughs> he's not a scared type of person. Me. When I was looking at the one in the, if, if I think if I'd have had any ability to move at all, it would have been a Charmin moment, but I, I couldn't even have a Charmin moment. I was so terrified when I was looking at the one in the, in the face that night. I was 16 years old when I had my first sighting and it was in the year 2000. And uh, what I was doing was I'd go out and bow hunt and family member of mine would drop me off wherever I want to go. And I'd go and hunt and then they'd come and pick me up at a predetermined time because we didn't have cell phones or none of that jazz. Or no way to get a hold of anybody or, or let them know if we were wanting out early or not. So we'd make a plan, you know, hey, I'll drop you off here. I'll pick you up either later on today or tomorrow or whatever time we set up. For the pickup arrangement so this time i was going to go up bassy grass creek and go up there and do some bow hunting and uh where bassy grass creek is is it's between the between two towns between a uh, central city and labaca arkansas and uh, i lived in labaca at the time so i had my family member drive me down to bass grass creek and if you go up the creek a ways that leads off into military base fort chat and a uh, Fort Chaffee's been around for a long, long time. And uh, it's most famous, you know, it's where Elvis got his hair cut. During the uh, Cuban crisis and all that, they locked up the Cuban peoples there. And uh, after Pearl Harbor happened and whatnot, they locked up a lot of the Japanese people that were living here and uh, had them locked up out there. It was been POW camp, active military base, all kinds of stuff. And, uh, at the time, it had been uh, shut down for a while as an active training base for a lot of years. And uh, they'd been revamping it up because they're about to open it up for a joint maneuver space and reactivate it. And uh, that was around the time that Department of Energy was uh, relocating their main headquarters out to Fort Chappie. It was in the, the late 90s and early 2000s. So anyways, if you go up this creek a ways, a few miles, it'll take you up into an area of Fort Chat, and you can get there without having to drive down the road. You know, you can just kind of slip in there. So I'd had my family member drive me up there a ways, and it was a uh, late September sometime. It was a nice day. It was a little chilly outside, but it wasn't too cold. The sun was shining. I mean, birds was chirping and whatnot. It, it was really nice and uh, a, a perfect day to just go on a little bow hunt. And so I had him drive me up the creek a ways there in the boat. And uh, I got out of the boat and started to do my walk in and stalk in. And I walked in about two miles, and just listening, watching, watching the birds and the wildlife moving around. Those squirrels running around and such. And, you know, the birds were chirping and whatnot. You could just hear the typical wood sounds that's going on out there. And, uh, I was hiking into this little swampy area. I mean, you know, it looked like a pretty good spot to do some hunting. 
So I found a nice little tree with an elbow on it, an elbow limb. And what I mean by that, it's like, you know, you look for the tree, it's growing up and it kind of has a limb that'll come off and up, kind of like the arm of a saguaro cactus, just a tree. And uh, I thought, man, that'd be a good spot to sit and watch what was going on in the woods around me, you know, and get myself relaxed and calm down into hunt mode. And uh, so I'd set up there in the tree and climbed up there. I was a good 10 foot off the ground and I'd sit in there and started noticing, you know, it was kind of getting quiet around. So I just kind of sat real, real still. And I was looking around and seeing if there was anything going on. Couldn't hear any more noises really going on in the woods. No trees being scratched around on, no woodpeckers pecking. Didn't hear any squirrels running around through the leaves and stuff. You know, there's always mice and squirrels and stuff burning around in leaves. You can always hear something scuffling about. Didn't even hear any bugs making noise. And typically, that's when you know there's a predator around in the woods. You know, that's when everything kind of gets quiet and watches. And in our area, we really don't have much as far as predators go. We've got coyotes, we've got bobcats, and pigs can be carnivorous. We've got quite a few pigs, but I ain't never seen pigs come through the woods and everything be quiet. And, and occasionally we have a black bear. Every now and then you'll see black bear, but they're not very common at all right here in our area. And uh, we've got panthers, and uh, they're few and far between the panthers are. But we've seen them our whole lives growing up at the Department of Natural Resources, Land Management, whoever you want to call them. You report a panther sighting, they'll try to chalk it up as something else so that they ain't got to call any kind of special protections or anything. More paperwork for them. But there's just not much as far as predators go. So I was expecting to see a coyote or, or see a bobcat if I was real lucky. But I was, I was kind of banking and hoping that a couple of coyotes would walk out. You know, I had my bow, I had to take four arrows with me and my skin and knife. And I was thinking, man, you know, if I see a coyote, that's $35 right there for the hide at the time. And so I was pretty excited about that. I thought, man, if I see a coyote, I'll just bag that dude and skin it out and bury the body of it because you don't need them things. And uh, just sit there and finish my hunt off and make money while I was sitting there. So I was just sitting and watching and waiting. So I was making a scan. I wasn't moving much. You know, I was only about 10 foot off the ground. And uh, I started kind of noticing the, some movement off about oh, about 30 yards. Yeah, about 30 yards away from me. It's a uh, sparsely wooded. There's there's quite a big gap between trees and there's a cane break right near the uh, creek I was on. And right there, moving kind of out of the cane break and in toward the wooded area is the biggest wolf I'd ever seen in my life. Now, at first, I thought it was a bear because I mean, you see something big and something black and it's moving slow. You know, it's like, oh, naturally, you, you think a bear. And uh, especially where I'm at because there's nothing else big and black roaming around out in the woods. And, uh, you know, I knew instantly it wasn't a panther because it, it didn't have a long tail. And it wasn't slinky. Panthers, they move real slinky a lot. They slink whenever they're in the woods moving around. They don't just bebop through the woods. They slink. And so I knew knew it wasn't a panther. Of course, I wouldn't have shot one of them anyways had it been. They're too rare to, to shoot, in my opinion. So there I saw, I saw this, this wolf. And I realized it was a wolf because the ears were pointed. It had like little tufts on the top of them, sort of like a lynx. It had a long muzzle. It, it wasn't short like a bear's muzzle. You know, bear doesn't have much in the way of a muzzle. So it had, had sort of a long muzzle, but not like a, a super extruding muzzle. Kind of a somewhere between a, a German shepherd and a, and a pit bull muzzle. Not too long, not too short, but a muzzle nonetheless. And it had a, like a short stubby tail. It wasn't a big old tail, but it did have some tail on it. So, I mean, I'm... <laughs> I was scared. I mean, just instantly. I mean, you know, you see a big old wolf moving through the woods. I mean, it was scary. So I was, I was watching him and, and, and seeing what he was doing and noticed, you know, his front legs are look, looked a little bit longer than his back legs. And, uh, I was like, man, you know, that's kind of, 
kind of weird looking, you know, and so I was just being quiet and letting this thing walk on by. I didn't want to have nothing to do with it. So as I was watching it, he was he was walking and he was just about right in front of me at, at a 12 o'clock position. May have been right around 1230-ish, right between 12 and 1 o'clock position. And it stopped. Now that really kind of scared me or put me on edge. I guess on edge would be a better way to say than, than really scared because I was just kind of edgy. You know, I'm 10 foot up in a tree. I'm not really too scared of a wolf getting me, you know, but I, anybody's going to be on edge sitting there staring at a big old black wolf about the size of a bear. So I was watching him and he'd stop. And he's kind of put his nose up, kind of given the, given the air a test, the, the smell. And I'm thinking, oh, crud, he had to smell me smoking. And I probably observed it for about a good 10, 15 seconds before it stopped moving and uh, put its nose up for a sniff. And I can't remember if the wind was in my favor or if the wind was in his favor, but something that big, there probably wouldn't have to be much wind blowing to smell me. So I was watching him and, and he put his head up and he was sniffing and, uh, and it was definitely a heat and, uh, it, it put its, hand because that, that's what it had it, it, it took its arm it's going from all fours put its hand on this small tree that was shoot out I, I reckon around four inches five inches round and inches around something like that just small tree it wasn't a big old tree but his hand wrapped around it put it put its hand on that thing kind of like a like you're getting up out of a chair you know you put your hands on your desk or if you had a rail on the wall, you'd grab that rail, you know, like in a handicapped bathroom, you'd grab that rail and kind of pull yourself up. And, and that's what happened. He grabbed a hold of that sapling that was right there in front of him and just easily, like, like he'd been doing it his whole life, just stood right on up on two feet. I can say 100% without a doubt, that's when I was definitely scared. So I looked straight down immediately. I just froze. I tried not to breathe. I tried not to move and immediately looked elsewhere. I mean, I was looking down at my knee, looking at, down at the tree I'm sitting on. I was thinking, I'm hoping this thing don't feel me looking at it or didn't feel me looking at it. Because anytime you look at something long enough, it'll look back at you. Everybody and everything alive, I think, has got that instinct to know whether or not it's being watched. And uh, kind of like the baboon, you know, instantly I'm thinking about the baboon or thinking about dogs. You know, you don't ever stare a dog down in his eyes unless you're showing dominance. And you don't nod at baboons <laughs> or stare them in the eyes. So I, I just didn't want to look at this thing in the eyeball or to even make facial contact. I'm not wearing camouflage. I'm just wearing a pair of blue jeans. And shoot, it was probably a green plaid shirt and a Carhartt jacket, you know. So I just looked like a guy that came off of a job site, went out in the woods with his boat and decided to hunt. You know, I'm not got no scent block on or anything fancy like that. I was just hunting simple. So I just sat there and I was looked down for a few seconds. And I say a few, I don't, I don't know if it was two seconds or, or 200 because it felt like an eternity. And I was listening while I was looking down. And I didn't hear anything. So it wasn't thundering at me or anything like that. So I, I was hoping that it had missed me. So I, I kind of glanced back up without really moving my head up just about as much as I had to, to be able to see in front of me. And from kind of a sidelong glance, I didn't just pop my head up, start staring back at it. I was glanced up. And uh, it was looking away from me at that time. And it was still yet sniffing at the air. So I just kind of kept my eye on it and shift my eye down and put my eye back on it, shift my eye down, you know, not staying too long on it. That way, hopefully it didn't get the feelings of, of being looked at. And uh, as, I, as I was watching it, he just kind of sniffed the air. And then it just walked away it it wasn't in no hurry it wasn't in a rush it just like like i was out on a stroll down the road you know he was out on a stroll in the woods i mean he was he was walking and sniffing on two legs 
and he was comfortably doing so. And uh, I say he because you could you could see he was a he and and had what he's have. And uh, he was black. He's probably a good, I'd say, anywhere from I was I was about ten foot up in a tree, and he was almost at eye level from what I was reckoning. So he had to be at least between eight feet and ten feet tall, given the terrain. Terrain may have went up a little bit or down a little bit. But, I mean, he wasn't he he wasn't too far off from me. He was turned around. He was he was walking off. So I just sat there and kept glancing down and and looked back up every now and then. Just seen continued walking off. And uh, after he'd made his exit, I just sat there. I I didn't move. I didn't get down immediately. I didn't exhale a big gust of wind. I just slowly resumed a a good breathing pattern and sat there till I could hear the wood start moving back up again. And uh, it seemed like forever. You know, I don't know how long I sat there. It felt like about half a day, but it couldn't have been that long. And uh, I started hearing the birds came back first. You know, you could hear some birds chirping around and stuff. And you hear the squirrels or the mice, whatever it was, rustling around down on the ground. And all the noises started coming back. So I was figuring, you know, well, his area of influence has definitely moved off. But I didn't feel like coming out of that tree at that time. Shoot, I was still getting my heart heartbeat back down to normal and, and thinking, I got a long walk out of here. And uh, I told my family members that I probably wouldn't be ready to leave till just about hour or two before dark and even then it's a couple miles back to the boat dock as far as a crow flies let alone on a walk but i sat there for a while until i felt safe enough to get down and start walking and uh i got down out of my tree and i didn't hunt on my way out but i'd walk about 10 steps i'd stop i'd look i'd listen i kept an arrow knocked the whole time and it was uh, it was scary. It, it was probably the the scariest walk out of the woods I'd ever had, and uh, I stalked my way all the way back to the boat dock, and uh, I felt safer there. You know, they got a concrete picnic table and there's lights, you know, at least, and uh, there's no public services or anything like that. It's one of them boat docks. It's just a boat dock. That's literally all it is. And uh, back in the day, they used to have camping and stuff out there. But uh, I don't know how long it had been since they hadn't. But I know it's been a long, long time. And the uh, Corps of Engineers got a hold of it, I guess, after it was probably private before. I really don't know. But uh Corps of Engineers was the ones that took care of the property down there. But that's all there was, was a picnic table and some lights. So I thought, well, if it does get dark before my ride shows up, I'll at least have a light to sit underneath. Oh, and I forgot that after he had walked away, before I'd got down out of the tree and I was sitting there, some does moved through, tracking in the uh, direction that he had went. The werewolf, because that, that's what I had. There's no other frame of reference for me. I just thought, well, that's a dad bird werewolf. I'd never heard of a dog man before. So, I mean, that, that's what it looked like. And it, it, had legs just like a dadgum dog or like a wolf, looked like a wolf on two feet with man-like hands with uh, definitely had claws on them or fingernails, I guess. I don't know what they were, but they were big and uh, kind of like a raccoon's hand, sort of, but it it wasn't like a little weak-looking hand. It was a muscular-looking hand. But, uh, yeah, them does tracked through, so I don't know if he was really – smelling of me or if he was tracking does off through that way or other deer that had walked through there because I was sitting near a trail where they'd been traveling. But there's no doubt in my mind he had to have known I was there. I mean you don't you don't walk up in somebody's house without them not knowing. Anyhow, so I'd walked all the way back to the boat ramp and uh sat there and I waited till my ride came back that evening. I, I sat there over half the day waiting start to finish. The encounter itself only lasted a matter of minutes. I mean, it, 
maybe 15 minutes at the most. Is, and uh, that was it for that first encounter. The second encounter that I had was uh, four years later. I was home on leave. And uh, a different family member and I, we decided, you know, we were going to go hunt. So that's what we did. And uh, we went out to Fort Chaffee. That's the place to go. Now, on this particular trip, we was in an area we weren't supposed to be in. And that's where we were going to go. We talked about it and thought, well, you know, we're just going out for we're meat hunting. You know, we're not hunting for horn. And uh, you can't eat them. You can boil them. They make a terrible soup. But the horns just don't feed you. So we sat and we talked and we decided we were going to go hunt the impact there. And uh, there wasn't any artillery and hadn't been any artillery going on out there. And uh, as far as we knew from the people we know on base, there wasn't any training going on out there. It is an off-limits, no-hunting restricted zone. So we were trespassing, and it, it would be considered poaching, too, then, since we were in an area we definitely weren't supposed to be so the way that we got there, there's uh, all kinds of access roads out there at uh, Fort Chaffee that they open the gates up during hunting season for the public to go in. And you drive down the road and find your spot, you park, and then do your walk-in. Now, you got to take a training class to be able to hunt on Fort Chaffee and go through the orientation. Some zones are bow only and stuff like that. So you get maps and whatnot. That way you can find out where you're going to hunt. And uh, this was in, uh, like I said, it was in 2004, and uh, it was gun season, so I believe it was in November. I can't remember if it was mid or late November, but it was definitely November. And uh, I decided I was going to take my Marlin 32 lever action and uh, had a 9 by 40 Leopold scope on it. And uh, a family member had a, a Springfield 308 with a 9 by 40 Leopold on it. We really like a Leopold scope. We figured those would be perfect for the impact area. We weren't going to shoot anything that was too far out, but we wanted something that'd knock them down quick. That way you could drag them out and get on out of there once you shot. And the drive-in was really nice on the dirt road. It, it wasn't really cold, cold, but it, it was cold. And uh, we found a good spot to park the truck in one of the open hunting areas. And, uh, stalked our way in to where the impact area was and there was once again just normal woodsy noises going on all kinds of squirrels moving around out there and stuff and uh we got out to the impact area and there's an observation like an observation platform that's pretty much shedded in you know you got four sides on it and it's got an open front so that you can sit there and watch and call for fire and all that stuff so, and we thought, well, we'll just sit up in there. You know, we'd be out of the wind if the wind picked up. Can't be seen in there unless somebody walks up in there and sees you. So we decided that's where we'd go. And uh, it's about two miles from the truck. Yeah, I'd reckon mile, mile or two miles from the truck. So we got out to the impact area and got up in the observation tower. And we're sitting there and just watching and scoping and waiting for something to come through. And, uh, We'd been there a little bit when we saw sitting there scoping out and about two, three hundred meters out, there's an old T-62 tank that they used for target practice. And uh, I was sitting there scoping and I looked over in the direction of that tank. We saw some movement coming in and uh, it was a big, big black thing moving off on all fours. And instantly I had that memory recall of what had previously happened with that werewolf that I'd seen up Bass Grass Creek out there at Fort Chaffee. Now, where Bass Grass Creek and that sighting is from there is, is only, you know, a handful of miles away. So that's that's not really too far as far as, you know, ranging territory goes for most critters and uh, especially predators. So I saw this thing coming in on all fours kind of looked like a bear but i didn't want to say what i thought it was immediately because you know I'd, I'd never shared that other encounter you don't just go around telling people you was out hunting saw a werewolf so we were sitting there and uh 
I looked over and at my family member said, Hey, what's that coming in right over there by that P62 glass that? And, uh, he glassed it and put his scope on it. And he was like, that is the biggest dang wolf I've ever seen. And I was like, yeah, it ain't a bear. There ain't no way it's a bear. He was just dumbfounded and amazed, you know, we're sitting there watching it. And about that time, it was about mid tank, standing about mid tank, walk, uh, still yet on all fours. And it puts its hand over on that track, about mid track where the gears are and puts his hand there. And that's when you could see through the scope. I mean, you can see it's obviously a hand. It ain't a, ain't a bear's paw. And, uh, pushes himself right up again like the first one had grabbed a tree and stood up this one put his hand on that track and just kind of stood right on up effortlessly it didn't look like it was bothered by it or anything and uh that's when a family member made an audible gasp and looks at me and says that's a dang werewolf and i was like yeah yeah, it sure is. You know, there ain't nothing else you can say that it is. Wolves don't stand up. We have wolves in Arkansas, but they're few and far between and further north. And uh, this family member and I had seen a wolf before, but I mean, it was the size of a really big husky or malamute. It wasn't real big and it wasn't all black either. But the wolves that we have are further north is what I'm trying to say. And there, and there's very few of them. But, uh, this family member had lived in Colorado and such and had uh, had actually seen wolves before in the wild. So had a good reckoning of what a wolf looks like. So we're sitting there and we were watching it. And it puts its nose up and is sniffing. I took my eye off the glass. You know, I wasn't going to sit there and stare at it too long through a scope either. Because, you know, if you're staring at something. It's going to stare back at you. Eventually, it will be in watch. It's going to turn around and look. And uh, I had no no interest in making any kind of eye contact. So we it it every time I looked at it, you know, it never paid no mind. Never really looked in our direction. Just kind of sniffed around. Even though it was a couple hundred meters away, there's no doubt in my mind that it could smell us. I mean, this thing's huge. It's got a big old nose. And a... Uh, the average dog has a little nose and can smell all kinds of stuff that we couldn't even begin to imagine smelling from any sort of distance, let alone right on top of it. And uh, we watched as it just sort of sauntered, sauntered off and uh, just have having a walk. And it had uh, the same black fur. It had like the little tufts on top of its ears. Kind of German Shepherd looking like ears, sharp pointed ears. And it was black. It was a male. It had what males have. But this one had sort of like a, across the, the back part of its neck, there's a, you know, some dogs and stuff kind of grow extra skin, fur, you know, got them a rough. That's what they call it, a rough, I guess. You know, where if they get bit or something, you know, they ain't going to get hurt. It's just extra skin and whatnot. But I guess around the the main area of it, across the shoulders and stuff, kind of had like a a white grayish tipped fur. I don't know if it was because it was still early and they had to do on it or whatnot, but that was the main difference between it and the first one. And uh, I don't really know how tall a T-62 is, but uh, it was standing, like I said, right next to it. And the top of his head was probably right around mid turret is about how tall it was standing next to an old T-62. It was about mid turret was the, the height of it. And uh, its direction of travel was east to west. It was traveling east to west. And it didn't seem in no hurry and just walked off. And we lost sight of it while we were sitting there talking to ourselves. And uh, amongst ourselves, and uh, he disappeared. And I looked over at him, and I was like, "Well, what do you reckon that was?" You know, and he said, "Well, it's uh, it's got to be a werewolf because there ain't nothing else it could be." And uh, we were both shook up. And a family member, without 
I was with, he's a combat veteran and he ain't one to get scared of things easy at all. But uh, he was visibly shaken and frightened. And uh, we had to walk back to the truck. So needless to say, our hunt was over. And uh, we sat there and waited a while. And uh, during the time that I'd seen it, everything was kind of quiet again. But really, there wasn't, you're actually out of the woods by the time you're in the observation tower. So there's really not a lot of woods right up next to you or anything to really hear a lot of noise from unless something loud noise was going on anyway. So I don't know if there was an area of silence around at this time or not, but uh, we got back off into the woods. You know, everything seemed normal. Didn't feel any hair prickly feelings or, or nothing like that. We took our time stalked our way back out and uh he looked at me and said you know it's probably a good idea not to even talk about this and uh of course everybody thinks you're nuts anyways but probably just something to kind of keep under our hat especially since we're in a restricted area and i don't know if there can still yet be prosecution brought for that or not but sure hope not but uh that was my second and last time i had any encounters with the dog man it really wasn't an encounter either time as as much as it was just a sighting you know there was there's was never any aggression shown towards me heck no acknowledgement really even of my existence but there was no no real need for it to stand up in front of me i'm pretty sure it knew knew i was there and we were there so you know, the only thing I could reckon was maybe it stood up and started walking just to kind of prove a point. I'm pretty sure it thinks humans think they're the baddest things in the woods with their guns and bows and whatnot. But hey, you know, kind of maybe strutting it I'm like, hey, check me out. These are my woods type deal. But uh, it really didn't have anything to do with me either time. So I was very blessed and fortunate in that aspect of the encounters or the sightings is, is what they really were more than encounters. But uh, those are the encounters that I've had. I guess I'll start back with uh, when I was uh, very young. Uh, I can say the big family. My father had to farm and he had to work a job. I mean, he worked a sawmill in a small town called Louisiana. I was born... Uh, few blocks on the Mississippi River in Natchez, Mississippi, you know, and uh, we moved so much having a big family, you know, and, uh, trying to get a bigger, bigger place. <laughs> but uh, I was born there. My father's from there. And we moved over to Louisiana side, getting closer and closer to where he worked, you know, and then he always would get a place big enough where he could farm. And we pretty much had everything, chickens, cows, or <laughs> we had everything, you know. But I had a good life, you know, a family that big is never was a boring day. But anyway, back then, it's like in the 60s, I guess, I could have been about six or seven years old. I remember my mother and my older siblings was always talking about they didn't want to go out. And, you know, they was picking cotton steel. Then if you couldn't afford a combine to help pick the cotton steel, they still was doing it by hand then, you know. It's no joke to pick cotton or even chop cotton. It's no joke. I've done it when I was about 12. <laughs> it's, that's work there. But anyway, I can remember always back when I was two years old. Not many people can can do that, but I can remember very well all the way back to about two years old, things that happened and things I've seen. And um, some days they would complain that they didn't want to go out because they seen something called neck. They was calling the neck of Sam. <laughs> And I didn't know what they was talking about, what they mean by Nick and Sam. So that's why I, I later on found out they were considered as Bigfoot. See, sometimes he would be in the wood line standing up watching them pick cotton and they try to do so. He was very large, some type of man, just big man, tall man standing up watching them work in the fields and stuff. So that's how, I, that's why I know uh, Bigfoot got so many names and I, I'm quite sure. Anyone that's listening to this, that's a new one to him, Nick and Sam. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's the same area where I reside now and where my father's uh, house is located. My father's house 
I was in the military and I came home and I asked him about the house and he said he was renting it to my cousin. And um, I left it at that. And I think I come home. I always took vacation around October of every year because that's when, you know, squirrel season, hunt season basically start. And I came on the second time and I asked him about how was she still there? He said, no, something ran off. And I said, well, what was she say? She seen something standing in the yard. <laughs> so I finally caught up with my cousin. And I asked her about it. And then I asked her, I said, well, what did you see? And she told me that she said, I seen some half dog, half man standing in the front yard looking around. And she said she walked out on the porch because she was going to work early in the morning. I think it's about 8 a.m., she said. And when she seen him, she said she just ran back in the house and closed the door. And then she said she looked out the window. He jumped over the back ditch and ran into the woods. Now, that area, my family got a lot of land. Um, one area whole 75 acres. And there's another area that have uh, like 50 acres. And that's behind the house I live at now. But it's just air property. You know, I can go and hunt fish all at once. So. She um, also said that she wasn't gonna never move back there, which is it just scared her to death. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine it's very scary. And then I asked, and she told me what it looked like. She said it had a, uh, a head like a dog and a body like a man. I didn't ask. She didn't describe the legs and the uh, arms or anything like that. She just said she looked at it and it scared her, and she ran. She, and she did say it was very tall, very tall. So uh, uh, fast forward a little bit, somewhere around the 1990s, my father, he had told me a story about where he had seen a Bigfoot walk across the road. You know, he was getting off work at the sawmill, and that's the same area where the house was at. And he said it, he was so big and tall, it took him two or three steps, and he was across the whole road. I remember him telling me that story all the time. So that's how I know. I kind of believed in Bigfoot, but I, as far as dog man, I didn't believe that exists because my first time I heard of it, I was in the military and we was having a conversation about Bigfoot and one of the guys brought up dog man. I kind of looked at him and laughed a little bit. I said, I don't think it's no such thing, but I know now differently that it is this. So, um, and after my dad told, I got my dad's story, and then that was all stuck in my mind. Somewhere around the year 2000, I got a job transfer. It's outside of Dallas area. It's just a small city, you know, called Lancaster, Texas, Lancaster. Some say Lancaster, some say Lancaster. So take your pick. But anyway, the area, when I first moved there, it uh, wasn't too much developed back where I was, but now it has, you know, boom, because they're building warehouses all over the place. And I guess, you know, that kind of um, pushed the population toward, you know, the uh, wood wood line area and where all the animals and everything at. But anyway, I kind of moved on the outskirts of it. And there was a, I moved right on what you call, they have 10 mile creek. And my house it set on, well, I didn't know at first, and I discovered this later. I planted a pear tree, <laughs> and the pear tree was stagnant, and I couldn't understand the thing. Every year, it'll blossom like it's going to do something and grow, but four years passed by, that pear tree would not grow. Now, that house, at that location, there used to be a bridge. I found that out later. So what they did was they moved the bridge over, put in the road, and they covered that old bridge with dirt. And whoever bought the property uh, really built the house on top of the bridge. And my house is like 15 feet to 20 feet, some parts of it, because it's the, the property is an acre, but it's shaped like a triangle. Because part of my property was on the other side of the creek. but. Um, one day I was how I discovered what I was on a bridge. I was uh, start to clearing some of the area back because that creek, it constantly run water all the time. You can hear it all the time. It sounds so beautiful. So uh, uh, my son and I, we got everything cleared out. 
And his room in the balcony is at the back of the top of the back of the house. And now he was able to look over the creek and see everything, see the water and everything. And that was beautiful. But when I was doing that, the second time I was clearing brush, I uh, noticed there was some covering where a lot of vegetation had grew over and everything. And I, when I started cutting that, and I noticed a big giant hole. <laughs> I mean, it was big, you know, I say about eight by 12 and the grass was all over. So I, I cleared all the brush away. And, and then I looked inside and I could see all types of animal bones. I didn't see any human bone. Uh, I, you know, cause I wouldn't know. I could see a human skull or something or human, uh, limb, but I knew something had been living there. And first thing coming to my mind, maybe, uh, it's a coyote den or, uh, bobcat or something like that. But I didn't think more of it, what it could have been, but it was pretty large and, uh, and what I noticed. And then I seen the concrete. And then when I seen the concrete, I noticed, I said, well, yeah, that's what the problem is. The house is built on top of a bridge and underneath is asphalt or concrete. That's why the tree couldn't, the roots couldn't go down and grow any higher. Now, Ten Mile Creek, my house sit right on it. Now, that was another episode I recalled, I listened to of yours. That it was a horrifying story, episode 106. And I thought I had listened to all, uh, the, uh, dog man encounters. And I, I said, well, let me go back and listen to some more. And I had stumbled upon 106 and I say, wait a minute. Th- this was horrifying that the young man was describing it. I mean, it's kind of unbelievable, but now I know he was telling the truth. They are on there. Those dog men are in that 10 mile creek and I don't know how many. But I know it's packed with coyotes and stuff like that. And um that's why, you know, it kind of made me come forward and go ahead and kind of elaborate on him because I know a lot of people just don't believe it really happened to him. But it's true. I believe, I really believe it really happened. Now, I wouldn't have took the chances he took, but <laughs> it, it, it's really true. It, it's something over there uh in that area, that creek. My son, there were some things that happened also that led up to this. My son used to tell me that, uh, daddy, something be killing something back there on the other side of the creek all the time. It'd be loud. And, then, you know, I told him, well, it's probably, uh, coyotes killing, you know, hunting, you know, feeding the owls or something like that. Got a rabbit. And then he would tell me, no, daddy, daddy, whatever it is, it's big. <laughs> it's, it's very big. And I kind of overlooked it. And then, um, that was another event that happened. We was, my son and my daughter was sitting watching the movie. Something came up to my patio and we had our security door on the outside and this have a handle you have to turn. You have to turn that handle and you can hear it when you turn that handle, it'll pop. And something turned the handle. And luckily it was locked that time because I had a habit. I, you know, I got fussed at at least three times a week for, for leaving it unlocked by my wife. I mean, she really get on me all the time. She had to go check behind me. She'll get out of the bed and say, I got to go check behind you. Because I always use that back door. I never go out the front. I always use that back door. But while we were sitting there, something turned the handle. And we all looked at each other. And then, of course, they were looking at me since I'm the parent. (laughs) They looked at me like, well, Dad, what you going to (laughs) do? You know? So I finally got up and looked through the peephole and the light was on, but I didn't see anything. You know, and so I went to each one of them and all the security lights on. I still didn't see anything, but I wasn't too concerned. And I said, you know, whoever is, if this is a person, he, he, it's very dangerous because I normally keep a gun in every room, you know, and that room, particular room where we were sitting, I had a shotgun under the sofa and um, I, I didn't have buckshots or nothing like that. I had slugs. So <laughs> I know if I had to hit something, you know, it would do some damage at close range. But anyway, that's a, that's another thing that happened. And then something else happened. I was at work one time and my, my daughter called me and she said, well, daddy, there was uh, two big giant rock wild dogs on the patio and they're laying against the door looking. They keep staring at the creek growling. And then, and she, the, I said, you didn't go out there. She said, no, I just opened the door and peeped out. The, the, uh, you know, like I said, I got the secure door. It's metal. So. They couldn't get through that. But she said, they paid me no mind. They looking across the creek growling at something, you know. I didn't think nothing of that either. And, and uh, so I told her, call the police, call the police. And the police did show up. 
And when he showed up, one of the dogs got really aggressive and come at him. And he had to shoot one and the other one ran away. I guess my daughter say, uh, police say he ran and ran into the creek area. So all these things are leading up to this, my encounter. Okay, let's go with my brother. I had a brother who was traveling and, you know, he's deceased now. And I miss him dearly, but I kind of wish he was here and I could tell him I'm sorry for not believing him. Uh, he come to visit and he wanted to pick up some pecans. I had about seven pecan trees in my yard and, you know, he loved to eat them, you know, just pop and eat them. So he came to pick up some. And when he finished, I came out, I had fixed him a drink. And we were standing in the yard and my back was to the creek. He was facing the creek and we were standing up talking about something. And all of a sudden he looked through and he said, what is that? And I said, well, what are you talking about? Is we are standing over there looking at us. I don't know. It look, it's real tall. And my brother, he's six four. And for him to say it's real tall, so I'm putting whatever he's looking at, gotta be about seven or eight or more. And he said, What is that you have living behind your house? And then I say, No, I'm thinking he's joking or trying to fool me. But I did. I finally looked around and I didn't see anything. He said, whatever it is, it's gone now. I said, then I really didn't believe him. He said, well, whatever it is, it's gone now. But he said, something living behind your house, man. So I really didn't think much of that either. You know, I kind of overlooked it, but it stayed in the back of my mind, stayed in the back of my mind. Now, I always get out hiking on the creek and everything and um, like to go all the time. And I had went many times, but one time I went, I decided to go a little farther behind my house and I ran up on this giant circle. I mean, perfect made circle, like a, some type of UFO landed or something. And I couldn't figure out I said, what made this because I looked up at the, it looked up and then those tree limbs and, and branches and everything was intertwined together, pulled over it. Like someone was trying to make something to protect herself from the weather or something. And I must have stayed in that spot for a long time, puzzled. What made this? What's living there? And I'm thinking, well, hogs wouldn't do this. No, not a perfect circle. It just baffled me. So and no no problem with that. And it stayed in the back of my mind. And then I think when squirrel season opened, I went across the creek on the other side of the road. And that's across the street from my house, which in the direction, I guess it was north, which way the creek was running. It's a lot of thick. It's very thick, and, and, and it's not a lot of woods, but it's very thick, brush and everything, all types of trees and stuff. And um, I, I had uh, ran up on another spot, same thing, another circle. I mean, it was perfectly made, and it was big. <laughs> and I don't know how to measure circles, but I know it's as big as a room, and it looked like something. The grass, everything mashed down, and that location that was a giant evergreen tree. You know, they stay green forever. So I was puzzled and I continued my hike and everything. I noticed uh, the farther I got, the more I noticed, you know, animal bones, you know. Now, there used to be a pastor when I first moved there. And I mean, some man, somebody had some cows over there. But within a year or so, I didn't see any more cows over and I never seen him come over there again. So, you know, I, I didn't know what happened, you know, why he don't bring them there no more. So um, I finally got to go, uh, I, I imagine it's another, or two, probably another year passed, and um, I w went to go hunting, squirrel hunting season open. And um, the first I went over, I always started behind my house, and I worked my way up the creek. And this time I was coming, getting close. I could have been about 20 yards from that evergreen tree on that second location I told you about. And as I was walking and, you know, a hunter, we all, you know, you know how to hunt. You're not going to just walk real fast. You want to take your time. You want to take so many steps, stop and listen, because you most likely you're going to probably hear something before you see it. So, that, that, you know, that's one of the hunters trade. You know, you're going to see something, hear something before you see it. And then as I got getting close to that location, I heard a growl. I mean, some type of roar or something. I, I, I was trying to 
place it in my mind. What make that kind of sound? It was low. The first, the first one was very low. It wasn't real loud. It was very low. And then, uh, so I, you know, I think I stood there for about a good three minutes. So I, maybe, maybe it's a hog. So you know, I decided to take a few more, about five more steps. And it did it again. This time it was louder. Okay. And I started getting a sense of something. You know, I just felt whatever it was, it was talking to me. I can, it's telepathically or whatever. I just felt it was talking to me. I looked around once, there ain't nobody here, but something's telling me, you know, you need to go back. Well, curiosity kills the cat. I want to see what what would make that sound. So I took a few more. That third time, it went off loud. <laughs> and I heard other people's encounter. They talk about bone chilling. Yeah, it's bone chilling. It's like it penetrates your bones, and it will scare you. It will scare you because you never heard anything like it. We like to relate things to other things. I couldn't relate it. I know how hogs sound, how liar. I've seen bears. I know how they sound, but that sound, I couldn't place it. Something was coming to me again. It's like, I know you. You don't, it's like it was telling me, you don't need to see me. I know who you are. You turn around and go back. And at that same time, I seen something move behind the evergreen tree, and it was big. And I say big, you know, I don't know if it's the same one my brother seen, but this one here, I put him around eight, eight or more feet tall. It was standing. I couldn't see the head or anything, but I can see shoulders like a chest, you know, because the tree was, he, I guess these, these um, beings know how to disguise themselves. They can let you see what they want you to see. Because I couldn't see the head. I couldn't see the leg. All I could see the center part. And it was big, you know. And at that time, I, when I seen it, it was telling me, I know you. You don't need to see. It's t- like it's telling me, I know you. You don't need to see me. You need to go back. And, and I obeyed. <laughs> I turned around. I started taking a few steps backwards. But believe me, I was looking behind me the whole time. And I only had uh, like a 22 rifle. And I always carried my sidearm, a 9 millimeter pistol. And I knew right then, whatever it is, I would just piss it off. Just like everybody else say, I would just piss it off. So I'm going to go back. And I never went across there again. But I, uh, that very next day, I was I had stepped out my front door and I looked up and I seen the buzzers just flying around. Some was on the ground; they was in the ditch. Just it was in front of my house, but just a little bit to the left toward the creek, you know, in the ditch. And I went over there to look. They flew the buzzers, you know, shoot them away. They flew off and everything. I looked down and there was this big giant rock wild dog, and, and he was like he was well, it was a half a dog. I only seen like the head up down to the the uh the rib area, and it was, it was like I wonder what happened to the other half. What what it, what can do that? And it, like it was a precision cut, like a surgery or something. The bottom portion missing, and I couldn't figure that out. And I you know I, I wanted to call animal control. I said, well, the buzzers look like they're gonna take care of it because it was <laughs> like about fifteen of big ones around there, you know, feeding on them. I said, well, they're gonna take care of it. Of it. So then I, you know, I, I finally put it together. I, I'm thinking that this, um, I don't know if dog man can do something like that, but this, I thought it was a warning to me. Don't come over here no more. And lo and behold, I never went over there anymore. So I, I didn't, you know. Now this recently happened, you know, and like I say in my mind, I always say I'm going to see him again. I don't know why. It's like I'm going to see him again, especially the area I'm residing in right now. Because they had been seen there by my cousin before. And recently, I believe my brother. Now, I did call him today and asked him about that, what he's seen. And he told me, <laughs> he's, not, he's not a kid. He's, he's in his 54 years old. He spent the night with me. And, um, you know, we men, we don't close blinds and curtains, all that. And he in the bed he was in, you know, he's right by the window. And he said he woke up about three in the morning. He seen some big eyes looking down at it. Now that window is pretty high because I'm six foot tall. That window is uh, the beginning of it is at the top of my head. 
So I know whatever he seen had to be real tall. He said it was looking down at him, big eyes. And I asked him to tell you, I said, well, let's try to describe it to me. He said, well, it's hard to describe. It looked like uh, uh, something, some type of demon or something. <laughs> he said that. The, I said, well, what the, what, what the eyes looked like? He said, the eyes was red. Red. <laughs> he said, fire and red. I say, Well, you sure it was red? He said, That's what I saw, man. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> he kind of made me leave him alone about it. And I say, Well, you want to come spend the night again? He said, Well, I'm not gonna sleep on that in that room. <laughs> so I kind of let him I let him go with it today. You know, I talked to him about it. And um that was recently. Now the one before that, this was last October. Squirrel season started again. I went to start to go hunting on, on our property. And I got to the edge. Before I went in the woods, I got to the edge. And on the side of the woods, there was you no know, farming. There was a field. They always put corn over there or something. And they hadn't planted yet. It was one of the time where they already had harvested. But by the time, it was about, I want to say somewhere between 6 and 8 in the morning. Because I got out there early. When I got to the edge of the woods, I noticed something running. No, it was moving fast like a horse almost. I mean, this is this is pretty big, and 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 I'm trying to place in my mind what is that? You know, I say like I said, I've seen a bear, I've seen uh, pretty much all the animals. You know, if you went to the zoo, you've seen them all and you heard them all. You know, but it was moving pretty fast in a straight line. It didn't see me, but I seen it, and I don't, I didn't see it chasing anything, but it was just moving. At a steady pace run, you know, like a horse gallop or something, you know. And lo and I just didn't go in the woods that day. I stayed on the edge because in my mind, I didn't know where it was. I couldn't really get a good facial shot at it, but I got the, you know, body shot. It was long. It was very long. And um, I think I could see a tail, you know, but it, the way it was moving, it was hard to tell. But I know it was the body of it was long. It was jet. It was black. It was jet black. And I have this neighbor next door to me. They pick up a lot of stray dogs and bring them home. And, you know, the dogs, if you bring a male, female, and you haven't spayed them, they're going to make pups. So he had one dog with my name, named Joe. <laughs> it was an American pit bull. It was the biggest one I ever seen. And I don't know what he's feeding him, but he's, he's huge. And he had a head big as a bear, I think. But Joe was a friendly dog, you know, he, but he didn't like other animals, other dogs and anything like that. And I mean, he was kind of vicious. I seen him kill one of his own sons, you know, and uh, uh, he was just brutal when it comes to uh, him being the boss. Matter of fact, if he come around you, he better pet him. He gonna, if you don't, he going to make you pet him. <laughs> it was, he was a character. But they eventually you know, those that litter, that litter he had with, with his mate that they uh it was nine, I think, because they had him under my house. And and uh, I had some problems with it, but I I love dogs anyway, so I you know, told him, Well, leave him there, told my neighbor, leave him there until he get old enough to come out and everything. And he did, you know. But the dogs started growing up and they just started tearing up everything around my house, chewing, you know, it's like a dog teed like a baby, you know, they gonna wanna chew on things. Uh, but in time, I start noticing they start, you know, disappearing, you know, one by one, one by one, you know. And then it was three left. It was one that looked just like him and the, his mate that he had the puppies by. There was only three left. And then one day, uh, I'm only there 50% of the time. I'm not it's pretty much like a getaway place to me. But one day I came there and then he came over to talk to me. He said, you seen my dogs, Joe? And I said, no, I haven't seen them. I said, and he said, they've been gone a week now and they haven't come back. And I was saying, you know, in the back of my mind, I, 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 I'm really thinking whatever I seen that day probably took them out. <laughs> you know, Cause Joe, he was the type probably would try to fight him. I don't know. But anyway, I, I didn't want to tell him. I still haven't told him to this day what I think, why his dogs are missing like that. Now, you know, they don't picked up another group and you got another, this, another little nine puppies. And these are going to be big also because this is, a, 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 the daddy is a lab. I mean, biggest lab I ever seen. And he's jet black and he have a habit of tipping up on you too when you're not looking, you know, scare you to death, you know. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, 
I imagine that he's going to start disappearing too. And then I'm going to have to tell him, look, uh, you know, there's things back here, you know, you, you, you need to uh, either put a fence up or, or try something if you want to keep your dog because they uh, there's too many dogs just disappear. Now, I, I know hunting season, sometimes dogs will go in the woods. And I'm going to tell you down that this is country country. They will shoot those dogs, you know, if they, they doing hunting season, the dogs coming through the woods up because, you know, they run the deer off and everything. You never hear from them again. They will. Some people will shoot them. I know of that. You know, but anyway, I think that's what's happening to his dogs. You know that um, there was something out there getting them. And I'm gonna tell you, coyotes will get dogs too. They will eat dogs. You know, it, 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 they eat you. If they get. They think they can take you out, and you know they get in a pack, and they think they can get you surrounded. They'll eat you too, coyotes. That matter of fact, where I lived in Lancaster, it was so many back there, and I could hear them at night carrying out and like they just eating each other. And then where I'm staying there, where my house is at, I mean, it sounds like they be at war at night. I mean, it'd be a war. But when they get to howling and growling and all that, they're always one just out of the norm. <laughs> it's not, I said, wait a minute, that's not a coyote. <laughs> you know, that's something else. That, that's too big. You know, that sounds so different. That scream. And it just sounds like they just be at war back there. So I made it a point. When I'm there, when night come, I'm inside. I won't come out unless I have to. <laughs> I'm serious because it, it get pitch black dog out there if the moon not shining. Now, I got security lights all around the house and everything. You know, a bug fly by anything. It's going to come on, you know. But I'm not going out there. Now, I got this cousin. He comes see me out every day I'm there. He's going to be there. He's retired, too, you know. And, We'll sit under the shade tree, have a beer or something, just talk about old times and stuff. But every time he come, he always got that big shotgun with him. And I had to ask, man, why Why do you have to have that big gun every time you come here? And lo and behold, when it get dark, he's out of there. And, 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 I, and, and I, I'm going to ask him again. I said, why? I asked him before. I said, why is it so dark? Come up and like you're scared. I say, well, I stay out here sometimes. I build me a fire and I stay out here till, you know, midnight or something like that. He say, you can do what you want to do, but I'm going home. <laughs> but he, I guess he going to, well, I know his, now, the one, my cousin, the female that lived in the house, that's his sister. So I'm quite sure she told him about what she, what she seen. He probably been scared her since. So I imagine that's why he keeps a shotgun with him. You know, and he's sitting out there all the time. That is my encounter, Vic, and now I know the young man was telling the truth because that area, I, he's like five miles from me on that creek. He's in DeSoto, I'm in Lancaster, and he's no more than about five miles from me, and and that's how I know it's true because it took me a while to put this together, but it finally come to me, and I wish my brother was still around. I could tell him I'm sorry, you know. He, I, I wish he had to push the issue. I'm kind of mad at him a little bit. I said, you knew that was there. You should have pushed the issue. Um, I want to say you should have pushed the issue a little bit more on I me. Mean, I would have believed you, you know, but he didn't. He just said, man, something behind you, living behind you. And I don't know. He said it's just something terrible living behind you because he's seen it. And he described it. He said, look, he got a head like a dog. And he said it was real tall. And he said it was black. And, and it was looking straight at us, standing there talking, just looking at us. And I couldn't understand for me when I look around, it's gone. That fast, something that big move, I should be able to hear it. So that just show you how lucrative these things can be. You know, they, I mean, they, they, and just like Bigfoot, they spend all their life in the woods. They know how to disguise themselves, camouflage themselves. And, and you'll never see them. They'll be looking at you. You'll never see them. And far as dog, man, they are living right among us, close, and you'll never know. My encounter is proof. He, they were li he was living right back behind my house across the creek. He had a den where I don't know if they stayed that long or what. Now, when I did go to that day, I did have a, it was a fire odor, but I couldn't place the odor. Now, I couldn't place it. I said, well, I know what a hog smell like. Uh, we had hogs and, you know, and I know what this smell like, but that odor, it was uh, apparently he had, he had left that area for a while because it was faint. It wasn't very strong, but I could. It was faint and it didn't smell well at all, you know. So I should have thought something then, but I just couldn't place it. I just couldn't place what made that circle that big and round, like a perfect circle, you know. And that's about it with my encounter. And there are some things, you know, like I say, you know, I've seen in my lifetime that people just wouldn't believe in, but it happens. It's all true.
60 years old now. I have no reason to lie about anything. I mean, what, what's there to gain? It's all true. And that young man's story on episode 106, I really believe it. It's true. And that's about my encounter, Vic. I've never been really intimidated by the grass men, but I haven't had them come right up on me either. So I suppose that would probably be a different story. Um, but his uh, cabin is in the middle of this campground. And in this campground, there's eight miles of roads. And the way it's set up is you can build all you want on your lot. You buy the lot, you can build what you want, but you have to have your RV as part of it, you have to build around it and it has to have the tongue sticking out where if you have to, you can actively back in, hook up and pull it out. That's the general rule down there. And like I said, they shut the water off in the winter time. Now they keep the comfort stations open with showers and where you can get water, drinking water and they keep the electric on. So he just pretty much stays down there and he's got a, a real nice cabin. It's, got the RV, which houses the bedroom, the kitchen, and the bathroom. And then he's built a living room onto it. Or Well, it was built when he bought it. He has a what he calls the band room, because he is a musician also, has these drums set up in there. And then it goes into a sunroom. And then out of the sunroom, you have the double sliding doors that goes out onto a deck. And then you go up the steps after you cross the deck, and you're onto a second deck. So it's two-tiered. And it's really quite unique. The first time we realized it was Dogman is when he put his camcorder out onto the first part of the deck and he pointed it in the direction in which we would heard the gas men mostly. And in doing that, it's showing in the view was the RV next door, the lot next to him. And that's all you could really see. It was the corner of his cab and you could see the bottom corner of the first step going up to the door the main door he uses. And then you saw some trees and another RV that just the end of it. Now on the other side, there was um, a camper, not really an RV. It was more of a coach type RV. And then there was nothing else on the lot. And then there was a street over there because this was part way up, you know, middle of the hill. So the street came from the bottom main road all the way up the hill and past his place and up around. And then, like I said, at the bottom of the hill, the main road went across and there was a street light down there. And they have all the anemones of normal campground. You know, they have the shelter house, they have the swimming pools, all that. It's just basically a gated community. But in the wintertime, there's only about maybe five people that stay in the whole campground. One night, right before... I went over and we were walking around the campgrounds. We got this bright idea. We had gotten this Bigfoot call, you know, grass man call from a a gentleman. This guy had captured. It's not even anything like I've ever heard before. It's more of a growl. It's almost sounds like a lion the way it growls. And this guy had experienced him all of his life and his grandfather his dad all of them all experienced them knew that it was the alpha male and he had actually got it recorded with a little recorder he set up outside so he gave us a copy of that well we got the bright idea to play this down there at the cabin at the campgrounds to see what would happen and we played it through this big bass guitar amplifier and it was pretty loud going across the bottom And we waited about a half hour and we played it again. And then we took off walking around the campgrounds. While we were walking around, we saw a car coming in the main road. And here it was the the local sheriff. And they pulled down. We kept seeing a guy come out that was down at the bottom of the hill off to the left, not where we saw the Bigfoot, but uh, it was off to the left down there. We kept seeing his flashlight come out and go around his house. Uh, and, and that was right after we did the call. And then the second call, we did it again. We thought, yeah, we might have stirred something up. We're not sure. But anyway, we saw this cop come in, the sheriff come in. And since my buddy was a director at the campgrounds, he went down because the next day they came back. The sheriff came back with 
another vehicle that was a blacked out SUV with no license plates on it. And my buddy, as curious he is, plus being a director, he wanted to know what was going on because he's kind of the sheriff in the grounds. You know, he keeps tabs on any strange vehicles anybody comes in. I mean, he's constantly cruising around on his golf cart, making sure nobody's coming in and stealing while everybody's gone in the winter. So he was kind of the, the marshal, so to speak. Well, he went down and talked to the folks down there and come to find out that after we did that sound, that call, the guy's boxer got taken off of its chain outside. The chain was still there. The collar was still there, but the dog was gone and he saw a black mask going into the woods. And that's when he called the sheriff. So kind of felt bad. Maybe we'd serve something up, but I think if it was going to happen, it was going to happen regardless of us. So that was the first experience. We, we didn't know what had happened, what it was. We were still thinking grass men. So it was, um, it was like a week later we put up the, the camera on the deck because we were still hearing, hearing grass men. And we had heard no dog men up to that point. But on that tape, we actually heard a uh, tree knock that sounded like a gunshot. And then we heard this really intense half growl, half bark. Then this thing shows up on tape. We see its shadow across on the other RV I was talking about where this uh, recorder's pointing. We see the shadow and you see the ears and the snout and then it opens its mouth and you can actually see the shadow of its teeth. And we just kept backing it up and watching it, backing it up, watching it going, no. What what is this? And it ended up, you can see it, the shadow of it walking over to the corner of the house, the cabin. And in the shadow, you can see its tail. You can see that it was standing on two legs, walking on two legs. And you can see the digigrade legs on it, done by its feet. Then it walks over and it looks around the cabin, around the corner. But when it came over to the corner, it looked one way, and then it quickly looked back at the camera, and then it backed up. And when I was able to isolate that frame shot and, and look at his face, it was a German Shepherd-looking face with the black around, you know, triangle on the nose coming down to the nose, around the, around the eyes and the cheeks, and the ear was swapped over, which was pretty cool. How it, you know. It was in, in action there when it looked one way and looked back and then backed up. And then in the picture, you can see its claws right right on the corner, just sticking out past the corner. And that's when we knew, okay, this is something weird. What's going on here? And, and, and I can't say that I'd never heard of the dog man, but I didn't really pay any attention to it because I had always thought dog man, well, that must be a, a deformed Bigfoot, Sasquatch, whatever. It must be deformed. You know, and it just has a snout. I mean, you know, maybe it was inbreeding or something like that. So I always thought until this happened. And then that was a rude awakening. And we had, at that point, we decided, well, we, we want to investigate because, you know, there wasn't a whole lot, not still not a whole lot out on the Internet about dog men. I mean, I've learned a lot just from your show, Vic, and another show or two i listened to a couple other channels and, and that's where i have learned to kind of cope with them more or less not that i'm down there at the cabin all the time but my buddy he decided to he was almost moved back home after we saw that thing he he was pretty pretty nervous about it wigged out as a, i like to say the old my age showing there but when we saw that, we decided, well, let's let's kind of, you know, go out and investigate this a little bit. So we started going up in the woods in the golf cart. And we would go outside the gates of the of the campgrounds and up into what we called the North 40. Which was basically the, the place that the whole campground surrounded by woods. I mean, just for miles, many square miles of woods. And. When we get out the gates, you go up through the woods, you get up toward the top of the hill. There's a clearing up there. 
And then when you get to the end of the clearing, you get, you wind around and go up through some more woods. And when you get up there, there's a little spot that's in the middle of the woods that's kind of cleared. And it has what looks like an old foundation. It's got a couple of really, really old panel trucks from like 30s and 40s. There are a couple of them deteriorating up there. And then what looks like remnants of an old fort. And the sandstone around it has what looks like musket balls in it, which we thought, thought was kind of fascinating. But we on the map, we never seen anything about it or in the history books because I, I did research that a little bit because I was curious about it. So we started going up in there. Now, mind you, my buddy, he's a, he is an adrenaline junkie. I'm not, but he is. So what he liked to do was when I, whenever I would go down there, I'd usually get there about 10, anywhere between 9 and 11 o'clock, I would show up at night. And he'd usually whip us up a meal. And then we would, while we were eating, he has like tons of DVDs. And he would throw in these old werewolf movies or a couple of the old time killer Sasquatch movies. And we would watch these while we were eating. Then we'd go out about one o'clock in the morning, get on the golf cart and head up into the woods. Now, mind you, he's an adrenaline junkie. I'm dribbling pee at this point as we're going up through the woods. You know, I'm scared and quite nervous about it. And then we would get up and we would stop and look around and listen. And we would hear sticks breaking. We would hear the growls. And once in a while, between the trees where it was light, you would actually see the shadow of a dog man. You know, with the hunched over, with the arms sticking out. and It was real quick, but you would see it plain as day. And we would look for tracks, which we found tons of tracks up there in the mud, you know, wherever the golf cart track was, especially after we'd love to go up there after a rain because we'd find all kinds of tracks. We'd find tracks with um, deer in front of them, you know, the dog man tracks, which at this point, we pretty much knew they were dogman tracks. They were bigger than any other canine tracks I had ever seen and he had ever seen. These tracks were a bit the size of her hands, which is uh, pretty big for, <laughs> for dog tracks. And, and that's the, the one thing that really struck me about these dogmen. The one that showed up on the tape, when it walked around and looked around the corner, it was walking across gravel and you could not hear. Any gravel at all under its feet, nothing. We never heard a noise until it leaned up against the side. You heard a little pock where it leaned up against the side, and that was it. And, I mean, it, when it walked away, you didn't hear sound. Now, if I walked out there or anybody else walked out there, you would hear the gravel. But this thing was just quiet, stealthy. And it, it was the same way up in the woods. You wouldn't really hear them. In the leaves, but you would hear sticks break now and then, and you would hear the low guttural growl, like they were telling us something. And after we'd hear that a few times, we would get nervous and get out of there. One time in particular, we were at that spot where the uh, panel vans were, and we were down at the the bottom of it. It was on a hillside, so we were down there looking and listening. So we walked back up to the golf cart, and when we got up there, we heard a noise. I, I don't even remember what the noise was. It was like like a commotion or something. We both heard it and we turned around and didn't see anything. We turned flashlights on and walked back down there. And right where we were standing by this big tree, there was a slash across it with five distinct marks. You know, there was a four and then the fifth one was kind of kind of faint, but it was in there. And it didn't, it wasn't like a, a bear where it was vertical. This was down at a, oh, probably not a 45, but somewhere close to that 45 degree angle. Just came right, like it just walked up and swiped the tree in passing. And then that one, we decided we better get out of there. So we headed back down the hill and back to the cabin. There, there was, uh, there's so many nights down there that I, I tr trying to keep, you know, the sequence. I'll never get the sequence because they happened. There was a bunch of them at least once a week for the last up until last year or beginning of this year, spring. I think it was we, I quit going down there. Long story, but him and I kind of had a little bit of a tiff about where all this stuff was going. He saw it one way. I saw it another. 
but we a lot of nights we were just set out on his deck on the top tier of that deck and we would see these things run up you'd see the shadow of them running up the road and you would hear them on the now if you heard them you would hear them on the pavement if they were running up the road or the side of the road you would definitely hear that because you'd hear the clicks of the toenails and you'd hear a little <laughs> where they were running and, and and so extremely fast it was unreal i mean the, the speed of these things is amazing and as far as you know them only coming out at night they, they seem to be more active at night especially in the campground where there's a lot of people it's like in the wee hours it seems like the, the witching hour is between three and four and it's usually right around three thirty is when they come out and really get noticeable around the cabin it's not always like that, but that's been the general average for it. We'd seen them once. My buddy, he had uh, decided to go up on the hill. So we have to go up on the hill at the campgrounds to get cell service. So he was going to go up and check his messages. And he went up on the hill, and he's parked. He's got his flip phone out, which that's all we ever used to take pictures was his flip phone. Well, he's got it out, and he's uh, checking his messages. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, this dog man drops down out of a tree. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a black and silver dog man. The head looks more wolf than it does dog. I mean, it's just, you know, more timber wolf. Big, protruding teeth. But the really the thing that got me the most was the eyes or amber, glowing amber eyes. And this was in daylight. It was like noon when this happened, and and, and I, I I hate to say this, but I'm I'm going to. He actually got a photo of it. Now this is nothing that's going to be shared or anything like that because we all know pictures are subjective. I don't even want to get down that route, but I got to see it firsthand, and and it's a pretty pretty scary looking dude. He has the the bodybuilder chest, and you can see a little bit of rip, or, you know, six pack. Because it gets down, but that's as far down as he got the picture. And he just basically snapped him thinking, I'm going to die, but at least I'm going to have a picture of what killed me. And then he said behind him, he heard this loud crack. And this thing jumped over the cart and was gone. And he quickly turned around and didn't even see it. It was so fast, it was gone. And that that was uh, the time when he decided that he might come home again. <laughs> but he still He still stayed there. I still continue to get down and we would continue to deal with these things. I mean, we'd be setting in the, they love to throw things at the cabin. You'd hear rocks hit sometimes pretty good sized limbs would hit the side of the cabin or, or land up on the deck. One night, my other half was down there with me and her and I were sitting on the couch talking to him. And it was about 11 o'clock at night. And we heard the loudest thump. I thought something hit the side of the cabin. She thought something hit the side of the cabin. We looked at each other with eyes big and mouths wide open. We both turned around and looked at my buddy, and he's sitting over grinding coffee, not missing a lick, going, yep, he's on the roof. Happens all the time. He said, you ought to be in bed when that happens. <laughs> and at that point, I was like, dude, you are crazy. I mean, I thought I was crazy, you know, watching the werewolf movies and going up in the woods with the guy. But, you know, he's down there by himself most of the time, and this stuff's happening outside. He just takes it in stride. Um, you know, he hears him walk across the roof, and he doesn't go out and get firewood for a while because he's afraid he might be up on the roof waiting on him because you never hear him come down. You only hear him laying on the roof. You don't hear him come down off the roof, uh, which, again, they're very stealthy. That's a pretty good testament to it right there because when they jump down, it's gravel all the way around except for the very back part, and that's just a bank with leaves on it you'd probably more than likely hear it as quiet as it is down there there was been nights where him and i one one night that really comes to mind was this kind of a scary night we were sitting in there in the cabin and we were talking and it had been raining so we thought well you know we're not going to go out tonight and walk around no way because we're not going you know we're not going to get on the or at least we're not going to get on the golf cart and go up in the woods because the rain was coming and going we didn't want to get caught in it. So we hear something outside. So he grabs his gun, this 45, and he goes out the door. And I walk over to the edge of the door. Well, he walks down to the edge of 
of the, this corner of the cabin. He stops and he comes back up real quick. He said, he's right there. He was right there. He was actually underneath the second tier of the deck, looking through the cracks across the first part of the deck, the lower part, and toward the door, watching to see where we were at, I guess. Or just, but he was just there watching. And it took off when he saw it. So we went down and investigated, and we found blood. And we followed the drops of blood around the side of the cabin. We started up the hill, and we found a bigger puddle up the hill a little ways into another lot. And at this point, went on uh, maybe another lot or two. And he says, he's right around here somewhere. He's got to be. And that's when it dawned on me, bud, we're uh, out here tracking an injured apex predator. I don't think we ought to be doing this. And that's all I had to say. He was like, come on. He was back down the hill. And we got down to the hill. And we decided, okay, let's walk up the road a little bit and see if we see anything. Again, I'm like, oh, why are we doing this? So we start up and up in front of us are two big red eyes. And they're heading down toward us. I turned around and ran. He couldn't run, but I figured he had the gun. I'm going to run. So we get back in the cabin, and that's where we stayed the rest of the night. That was just too much. So, you know, again, we calmed down a little bit. and We have some other experiences with them going up in the woods. Uh, one of them was a, really a comical experience, I got to say. It was, um, mother half and his mother half, his wife, my wife went down. We all went down there you know, to see him and uh, wasn't really planning on doing anything but sitting out on the deck watching. And I had bought this really cheap night scope off of a uh, marketplace. So I took it with me and we're checking it out. And we're looking around up on the deck and all of a sudden well, he noticed it first, but right across that empty lot where the coachman type RV sets and over across the street that runs down the hill, lied this big black dog man i mean i'm assuming it was black it was through the scope but you know it's really hard to tell that that actually was black but it was very dark and we couldn't see no glow on its eyes that was what was really weird to me but we didn't have lights on either we were out always trying to keep them off so we could see the only light was down over the hill or the main road where the street going down the hill met the main road at the bottom there was a uh, street light down there so we're, we're watching this thing, and we don't know if it's looking at us or what it's actually doing, but you could tell what it was, and it would move every once in a while. But we never felt threatened. We, we, we didn't know what it was doing. We thought it was watching us. We wasn't sure. And, and it was cold outside that night. So we go inside and decide, hey, do girls want to come out and see this thing? It's laying out there. And they're, of course, well, heck yes. Are you crazy? We want to see. So they go out. I stayed in because I was freezing. I said, I'll be out in a minute. Well, no sooner than they walked out there, they went maybe two, three minutes. My other half comes back and says, hey, come here. You got to see this. I was like, oh, honey, I, I was already out there. I saw it. I said, I'll be out in a minute. She goes, no, you don't even have to go outside. Come here. So we went around to the sunroom where you go out to the decks. And we're looking. She's pointing out the window down at that street light at the bottom. And you can see these shadow figure black shadow figures running back and forth across the road and they didn't appear to be you know huge it almost it reminds you of kids playing is really what it reminds you of but you would see the flash of color every now and then you would see it blue you would see um the amber and red flashes of light and i i knew right away it was their eyes but <laughs> well other half she says What's them flashing lights? I said, well, honey, that's their eyes. And she says, well, what makes them flash? And I started blinking my eyes real quick and turning my head. And then she punched me in the arm. <laughs> it was quite comical, really. And, and like you said, the whole, that whole time, we didn't feel threatened by anything. I mean, we kind of put two and two together. I don't know if this is, true, if this is actually what was going on. I thought it was. He seemed to think something else of what was going on, but he didn't say what, but I thought that the, it was um, an adult watching us knew we were out on that deck. And then while the young were down playing, 
as what I thought. And, um, and it stands to reason. I mean, we have, we've documented six different dog men down here, in this place. So we know there's a pretty good sized pod down there. The one, okay, I'm jumping around here. But as you'll say, there's, um, there's no set time for these things. They'll come out in the dark. They'll come out in the daylight. They've been seen coming down out of trees on people's lots. I mean, other people are catching on for sure that they're down there. They're keeping it pretty quiet, though. One time, it was about 11 o'clock in the morning. We've been up all night watching these things, and we've been reviewing tapes. You know, we stick the tapes out there, and we review the tapes, watch and listen on them, and, um, you know, try to write down every sound we hear and what time on the tape it was. We take turns doing that. It was quite tedious. I was getting ready to leave, so we're outside talking, and um, I looked down over the hill, and there's this black dog man looking around a camper at me uh, at us uh, you know had and this one had really tall ears and they were more on the top of its head than the side which kind of struck me and they weren't floppy they were straight up like um like a german shepherd or doberman's cut ears they were sort of like that and there was no the color was uniform there was no shades or anything that i could tell and it was pretty bright out and it was pretty close it was maybe, I don't know, 30 yards over the hill. I mean, it was really close. And then it ducked back around, and then that was that. I drove down, and it was gone. So I had to drive by there on my way out when I was already leaving. So when I drove by, there was nothing there. There's been times where well, one particular time I was ready to leave. It was, you know, in the wee hours, about 4 in the morning, still dark, not quite getting daylight yet. And... He was behind me. I said, you got to cover me while I get in my car because, well, this time I was in my truck. But where I park at is right alongside the decks. Well, the lower deck that you walk out of the sunroom onto sets kind of lower to the ground. This may be um, three feet as the lowest point that goes up to maybe four and a half feet before it goes on to the big deck. And it sticks up a lot further or the second tier of the deck. But right there where I park is, is an opening in the lattice work that goes under that deck. So I always, you know, you, know, you got to cover me. We got to check out, make sure nothing's under this deck before I walk around to that opening. And this particular night, as soon as I walked around the corner, this tail came up right on the driver's side of my truck and we heard a thump and it was gone that quick. Now, he didn't see the tail, but he heard the thump. He said, what? I said, that was a tail come up i said he was right over there on the side of my truck so we eased over there we didn't see anything he was gone thank god <laughs> um that was a harrowing experience for sure but the the main one the scariest one was the one the last time i was over there this particular night it was kind of the beginning of our fallout we were discussing what to do with all this stuff and uh um, since we used his equipment most of the time, I mean, you know, any photos were done on his flip phone. We didn't want to point cameras or anything at these things and, and to, you know, cause them to go off on us or whatever. Um, and then, of course, the camcorders, he had several camcorders that we used down there. They were um, easier to work than mine was. So we used them. I didn't think nothing of it. You know, we were partners. It was a big deal. Well, that started coming to a head all of a sudden, you know, well, this is my stuff. Oh, really? So, you know, we're arguing. We had the window open and we're arguing pretty good. Pretty spirited, so to speak. We weren't coming to blows or anything like that. We'd never do that because we're you know, blood brothers. But I was pretty upset. And he was trying to explain his point of view. And we were at it pretty good. And I said, well, you know what? I've had enough of this. I'm done. I've had enough. I'm going home. And I remember looking at the clock. It was 1230. I started toward the door of the cabin. And when I got up to right in front of the door, maybe five feet from the door, there's a little monitor set up right there with a speaker. And it's just one camera, security camera that, that points out over the driveway. Well, through that speaker, we heard that dog man's half bark, half growl. And it's like, oh, no, I can't go out there now. So I stopped. He stopped. He heard it, too. And we're sitting there and we're listening. And as we're listening, we hear the familiar creak of the 
steps coming up to the door. Then the doorknob rattles ever so slightly. So now, I mean, they'd never done anything like this before, you know, never testing doorknobs or anything like that. They usually just throw things at the cabin or jump on the roof. This time it jiggled the doorknob. So we're stopped and we're looking at each other like, holy crap. And about that time, the floor raises up under us. Now, now I'm not talking, you know, it didn't raise up no six inches or a foot or anything like that, but it was enough to feel it for sure and know what was going on. And, it, you know, we he looked at me and said, you know, I think it's on all fours. And Scott's back against the floor joist is pushing up, you know, we're whispering. And then we heard something outside the band room window. So he grabs his 45. He heads in there to the other room. And he says to me, go, go into the kitchen and look out the window to see if anything's around back. And I'm thinking, you go into the kitchen. And look, you know, I'm already, already freaking out pretty bad. So, well, he's in there. He's there's, you know, towels covering up the curtain or the windows and then curtains too. So I use everything kind of made a little sliver and I look out and I don't see anything. And that's enough of that. I'm heading back to the living room. And then he comes into the living room sweating turn whiter than he normally is because he's almost albino anyway you know real blonde hair and white skin he says i screwed up i said what'd you do he said i got down on my knees and i opened the blind toward that adjacent lot where the coachman sets he said when i pulled the blind up there was two of them out there and they he said they didn't look at me but they just backed up real slow into the shadows so at this point we're, we're, we're discussing what to do. And then the floor raises up again. And it probably did it three or four times through the course of this ordeal. And, you know, when he's still under there and, it, and he always knew where we were at, because of course he could probably tell by his footsteps where we were. And it ended up, we spent the rest of the evening, him on one end of the cab with his 45 cocked appointment at the door, me at the, in the living room side with my 357 Magnum cocked, and pointed at the door, motionless, quiet, listening, and watching. And we'd hear him scuffle outside a little bit, just little um, scuffling noises, but didn't hear no growls or anything. And like I said, that floor would lift up now and then. So knew he was still under there. And come about you know, just a little bit before daylight, I think it was around five or something like that, we'd had enough. And I had to get home back here to get my grandkids. We have a grandkids. So I had to get them on the bus, make sure my daughter gets on the bus. My other half, she would be going to work and that was my job to get them on the bus. So about time for her to leave, to go to work. And I had no cell service there to, to even call her. It's not going up on the hill. So I know I'm already in trouble and I'm scared too. Well, that fear turned to more of an, you know, just downright rage. Just the fear turned to anger. We were just livid at this point. I was like, you know, I got to go home. I've had enough of this stuff. And um, he, the same way. So, you know, we had shut the window earlier when this stuff first happened because we, we, we didn't want them, you know, to hear them that good. We wanted to know where they were at, but we didn't want that window open. So we went back over. He covered me while I pulled the curtains back, looked out, nothing's there. So I opened the window and we both, Y'all, come and get you some and with some pretty, you know, expletive terms in there and colorful names for the, for them as well. So we've had enough. Come and get us. If you're going to do this, let's end it now. I mean, we're yelling. And we hear silence. Nothing. Nothing happens. Nothing stirs. Nothing. So we sat there and listened for about another maybe half hour. And we're hearing nothing. Okay. I'm going to make a break for it. He says, well, I'll come out and cover you. And then you cover me while I walk around to where the opening of the crawl space is. Okay. So at this point, I had my car this time. So I get in my car and I back down. I start around. I think I have a guard. Uh, not that it matters. Anyway, I'm in my vehicle and I ease around and I'm watching got you know, my gun and, and I'm watching as he's easing around underneath the big part of the 
up the uh, second tier deck and around to where the crawl space was, which was back up past both decks and come in under the sunroom and went across into the living room. So he gets around there and he just stops and he scratches his head. He turns around, looks at me and shaking his head. I have a window down. I said, what? So he comes walking back down there and he goes, those things shut the door and put everything that I had stacked back up against the door. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, not at the same place, but they put it up against the door. Now, Vic, what in the heck does that except for a very intelligent being? First of all, to know that that door got him under the crawl space. If you pulled the stuff away, it would open up and he could go under there. And secondly, to put everything back. It just had the wherewithal to do that. And uh, I was bewildered, and so was he. And, I mean, that that was probably the scaredest, I think. Like I was telling you earlier, Vic, that's the second scaredest I've ever been in my life. And I know my buddy's been pretty scared. He never admits when he's scared, but you can see it. You can hear it in his voice and see it in his face when he gets scared, which isn't very often at all. But um, that night, that was probably the most intense they'd ever, because they had never done anything that brazen before. I don't know if maybe the fact that we were arguing brought negative energy and that that's what brought him in, or if it was the fact that maybe they saw me as a threat because I was yelling at him and we were back and forth yelling. Well, we weren't really yelling, but we were pretty loud. And maybe they were coming down to protect him like he really needed it from me. But I, I don't know. But so I was still trying to put that together, what brought him in to do what they did. Because they had, like I said, they had never done that before. Never got that brazen. And, and, and one thing I, I did want to mention, too, what was really, when the one came down and we, you know, it looked around the side of the cabin at the camera and stuff. There was a garbage bag sitting out on that porch where the was right outside the door that had food in it. And, and it was cold, so the food was still fresh. You know, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't rancid or anything like that. But they never touched it. Nothing, that one that came down to the cabin never touched that garbage bag of food. And I thought that was kind of bizarre. They didn't, you know, he didn't mess with that. But anyway, that's that's most of my encounters right there. Um, when it comes to mind, like I said, there's been a few of them. Uh, and I know there's probably some that I'm forgetting because it, there, there was just, you know, this was every week. I get down there at least twice a week for a while and then tapered off to once a week. And then, you know, more, more it, you know, less and less as time went on. But for a while, I mean, every time I get down there, something would happen. You know, like we'd be either setting up on the deck, seeing them, or we'd go up in the woods, see them up there. And like some, we've seen some different individuals. The, the one that looks like look more like a German shepherd than anything. There's the one I saw that was black. And the one we saw that was black and brown and white. And then there's the gray and white one. And then there's a it's more a reddish brown and white, which he's a big one. That's when I was up in a tree and dropped down. It, it was kind of comical. He was coming down with the golf cart. He called me up right immediately afterwards. You know, he's he still here to fear his voice. It's not funny, but you'd hear him. Uh, he would was coming off the, the clearing up on the hill and he saw it up in a tree and he says, you come down here, you little, you know, whatever. I see you up there. And said, it, it did. It came down the tree. And, and he said, uh oh. And it kind of started walking away, but it was walking around toward the back of his golf cart. You know, it was about maybe 60 yards away. And he thought it was going to come around and flank him. So he fired in the air and it turned. But as it was walking away, it would turn back around. He said, and give him the most god awful, most evil look. Like, yeah, you're getting a free one this time. And then that's when he cleared out of there Pr pretty quick on that point, you know, because <laughs> it had enough. Oh, yeah. One thing I didn't mention to you, but 
people talk about the mind speak, the Bigfoot, you know, the grass men doing the mind speak. Well, I think the dog men are capable of that too, because there have been two occasions down there where just out of the blue, it'd be pitch black out. And in front of my eyes, I would clearly see a dog man in his full glory. One of them was the German shepherd type with the, um, the digigrade legs, the, um, it appeared to be, you know, brown and black with some white on its chest and, and white in its mane, which they all have a mane. And it would just appear right in front of my face and then be gone. And, and for no rhyme or reason, I, I don't know if that's mind speak or, or not, but I, it's never happened to me any other time around anything else. And then the, uh, the empathy and fear that they can put that fear on you. I can't remember which episode it was. The guy was talking about it. One was up in his barn and he's hayloft. He'd been putting hay away and he came back out. And then he said he had that, that feeling of dread came over him. And that happened to me also. We were walking around the woods. It was broad daylight. And it was my buddy and me and his wife. They were on the golf cart and I was walking on an adjacent path, just kind of looking around, looking for any signs of anything out of place, whatever. So I'm walking down this path and that feeling just took over me. I mean, this feeling of dread, just absolute fear. And, and, and it's weird because it's almost like an out of body feeling because it, in my mind, I'm saying, why am I scared? Why, why am I feeling like this? Well, what's going on here? And, and it just kept getting worse to the point where I turned around, actually sprinted back toward the other path, which for me to sprint, there has to be something major going on because this boy don't run anymore, especially with boots on. But I sprinted back. And as I got back there, he was coming down the path in the golf cart and his wife was running up the path toward us. And she said, oh, my God, oh, my God, there's something big and black just ran across the path down there. And I was heading right for that direction when that feeling hit me. And that's the only thing I can put it down to because there was no reason at all for me to be scared, especially that, that scared. I mean, that dread, it, it was, it wasn't as much fear as it was dread, I guess. It just really dreadful feeling like, like impending doom or something. I don't know. It was, it was really weird that I experienced those things around him. So there's, you know, the, it tells me that they're, they're flesh and blood, but there's something else going on. I, I, they can def they definitely bleed for sure. But as far as what they are, I, 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 I want to know. I have no clue, but I want to know. That part of me still wants to go out and try to find answers. But then the other part of me says, hey, there's many times that they wanted you. They could have got you. How many times are they going to? do that to where they just finally had enough and said, okay, you're done. And you wouldn't even see them coming. So, you know, how, how, how far do you press your luck? I guess. Or should I press my luck? So I'm kind of straight away from going out and looking for them for now. So that's about all I got, Vic. Where this encounter happened, my best friend, his family owns a little farm on about 200 acres out in the Jack Fort Mountains. And to give you a little bit of setting of this place, it is so far to get out there and so far away from civilization. You have to drive 26 miles down a dirt road going no faster than 24, 25 miles an hour. It's just a nasty, scraggly dirt road. When it rains, it's washed out. And... It's the prototypical journey. I mean, because when you get in the vehicle and you leave from the house to go there, you know you're going on a journey. Because I mean, you're just going through woods and woods, and it's just awesome. And then when you get to the farm, there's a cabin on this little hill, and it's a tiny cabin. It's got electricity, and that's where you know we set up at. And it's fenced in. It's got what we call the barn to the left of it. It's got the hog pasture to the right of the barn. And then the whole land just takes off. Well, my first encounter happened, at, like I said, in August. 
and it happened roughly at two o'clock in the afternoon. That's what makes my encounter, in my opinion, so crazy is that it was broad daylight. My friend and I were prepping for some early deer season stuff, and we were setting up feeders, deer cams, stuff like that, putting corn out in different spots, getting some tree stands hung up, stuff like that. And we had just set up a feeder on where we call the field. The field is roughly a mile and a half to the left of the cabin on a downward slope. That's where we do a lot of the hunting. There's a lot of different trails that stem from the field. They go down to a a giant creek bed. They go back up to another area. In a smaller field, they go over and around to a shell pond. Then go all the way back up around to the cabin. There's multiple different routes, but the field is kind of the hub of where we start our hunts at. Well, anyway, we're setting up this deer feeder. And I I usually carry what my friend calls the heavy artillery. I usually carry, you know, 12 gauge shotguns or a 308 rifle or 4570 rifle. I usually carry really big weapons along with a 45 handgun. Well, all that just happened to be in the truck. And the only thing we had is my friend, he had a little 20 gauge shotgun and it had bird shot in it. And as you know, everybody knows bird shot is not meant for anything bigger than birds or small animals. But as we set up the deer feeder, he goes, hey, Shadow, why don't we take the long way back to the truck? Because at that moment, we were probably 100 yards from the truck. He said, why don't we go through that giant cleared out ravine, which used to be a river, and you follow it all the way back and you'll circle. It's almost a thousand yards and it twists and it turns and it winds and it will come back right by the truck. He said, let's go through there and maybe we can find a rabbit or a squirrel and we can use that as coyote bait to my Viewers that are sensitive, I apologize, but, you know, in southeastern Oklahoma, coyote hunting is a big deal. They have tournaments. It's it's what we do. And if we use smaller animals as bait to hunt the coyotes. And I said, okay, that's not a good idea. And without thinking, you know, I didn't think to go back to the truck and grab my 4570 or my 308 AR-10. I didn't think to do that. I said, okay, I'm just going to go for this nice little nature walk. He's got the 20 gauge because that's what you need to shoot a small animal. You don't need nothing big. So we start walking and we get down this ravine and to kind of paint a picture, picture yourself in an old dried out creek bed with about two feet on the right and two feet on the left kind of up. That's how you would walk up into the woods on each side. And the woods on each side are thick. I'm talking thick, thick jungle, prototypical forest foliage. I mean, you couldn't see two, three feet in the woods if you wanted to. The only thing you can see is the daylight that comes straight down. You can see the sun that comes straight down into the creek bed. If not for that, if the trees would have grown over, it would have been pitch black. So we were walking. And like I said, this ravine... Is probably a good thousand yards from where we were at back to the truck. It's a pretty good little trek. And we probably walked, I don't know, three, four, five hundred yards, and we start hearing something. And I'm standing on the left, and Jason is to my right. And it's about that time, as I said, we start hearing something. And if you're in the woods a whole lot, you can hear all kinds of stuff. And you start to distinguish stuff. But this right here was one of the most interesting noises I've ever heard. It was heavy. And it wasn't your prototypical deer or or pig or whatever it was. It was walking and it was heavy. And as most hunters know, when you walk through the woods, even animals, they walk carefully. Not to disturb their prey or if they are prey, not to be hunted. That thing's going to walk through the woods trying to make noise. But this thing didn't care. It was heavy, and it was walking like it owned the land. And my friend looks over to me, and he goes, do you hear that? And I go, yeah. He goes, 
is it on two legs? And I go, well, it really sounds like it, doesn't it? He goes, that is crazy. And obviously, I'm talking a little louder than we did. I mean, we were whispering, and we were just kind of in shock. It was probably, I would say, a good 20 feet behind us, and probably probably just right there, right there at the edge of the creek bed, about 20 feet back, but in the woods. And it was, it, like I said, it was just walking so heavily. I'll never forget that. It was just thromping, like just a happy-go-lucky kid just going to the candy shop. It was just cruising through there. And it followed us probably a good 200 yards. And then that is when it just shot from right behind us to probably 15 feet right in front of us. And we stopped because we heard it. And that's when it stepped out. And it stepped down off the left side of the creek bed. And it came down and it walked almost dead even with my friend and I and it caught and it turned its head and it kind of looked at him and it cocked and it kind of turned its head back the other way and it kind of looked at me and kind of straightened its head and it kind of kind of like it was baring its teeth and I didn't see it baring its teeth as a sign of aggression it looked like it was trying to smile almost like Hey, yeah, that's right, you idiots. I'm here. I'm real. And we're just staring at this thing. And I got a good look at it because it's it stood there for every bit of 40 seconds to a minute. And it could have been shorter. It could have been longer. But when you're looking at something like that, time stands still. And I looked at it and it, and it, and it stood up on haunches. I looked it right in the eyes. And its eyes didn't glow. It had really normal eyes. They were yellow, but they didn't glow. But the one thing I'll never forget were the ears. The ears just stuck straight up. And they kind of twitched. And then as you look back down its body, you know, it's hairy. It's covered in hair. And you got the snout that stuck out. And then the hands, it had real hands. It didn't have just claws. It had five finger hands with long claw nails on the end of it. And it it was just, you hear stuff and you see movies and you hear stories and you're just like, oh, well, that, that. Well, this was, this was right in front of us. And it was very realistic looking. It was, it was probably, my friend is 6'3". And it was a little taller than him. So it was probably at least, it was at least 6'4". And it could have been as tall as 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, and it was real healthy. It probably weighed a good 270. And it just stared. It didn't make no weird growling noises or anything. It just kind of looked at us, breathing. And then almost as if nothing, it just turned. Almost kind of like a military-style to the left and it walked right back up into the right side over to my friend's side now. And before I could say, did you see that? He cocked a shotgun. <laughs> and as you, we all know a 20 gauge would do nothing but tick this critter off. But my friend was just, you know, he was doing what anybody would do. Show a force. This is my land. I'm the boss around here. Because you can't be scared in those situations. And that's one thing that we were trained. I can't say trained because we have no real experience, but we were raised by our parents and family to do is when it gets when the going gets tough, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta act like you want to be there. You gotta you can't be scared. You can't back down because if you show fear, it's over. It's got you. Were we both terrified? I will never lie. We were we were scared to death. I mean, if I'd have been drinking a lot of water, I might have used the restroom on myself. But it was just one of them deals where you just had to stand strong and you knew that no matter what happened, we were there. We had each other. We was going to try to find a way out. So we walked and we just kept going down the trail. 
we knew that we were close. We were within four to 500 yards of the truck. And we knew that if we just kept walking, we didn't panic. We didn't scream. We didn't run. We didn't shoot that we could probably get back to the truck. And this thing walked right beside us. No farther than five to six feet away from. You could barely, you couldn't really see it, but you could tell it was there. You kind of see a little bit because the foliage was so thick, but it was there. And it just walked right beside us the whole time. <laughs> you talk about, you talk about fear. Knowing that that thing is just right there and it's just feet away from your buddy. And heck, that thing's arms probably could have made up the distance of a couple feet. So that thing could have just reached out and snagged him. And it was just, like I said earlier, it's one of them put some get right kind of moments in you. You just know that you're not, you're not as powerful as you think you was. Especially at the time, you know, 2018, three years ago, two 23-year-old kids. I mean, yeah, you've been able to drink for a couple of years, but you're still young. You ain't seen a whole lot of life yet. And that's, that's just right there. That's life right in front of you. That's one of the moments that will change everything, the way you look at everything for the rest of your life. And as we go, we get back to the truck and we can see the truck. We're close. We're within, we're within 50 yards of the truck. And I know, you know, always been more athletic, but he looked at me and he said, listen, I'm going to hold this thing off. You go to that truck. You take off as fast as you can. He said, you get one of them guns. He said, you turn around and you get it off me. He said, if it's killing me, shoot me and then get it. And I was just at that moment, everything just hit me. It was real. It was all real at that moment. And he turned around and I just took off. As fast as I could. I'll be honest with you. I don't got the longest legs. and I'm not the fastest runner. But I, I ran. And I grabbed. As soon as I got that truck, I reached that window and I grabbed the AR-10. And I pulled the action on it in mid-turn. As I turned around, nothing. He's just standing there holding that gun. Looking into the woods. Nothing came after him. Anything. It was It was crazy. You know, I was... As you're running, all them scenarios play in your mind. And, you know, you just you think of your buddy getting mauled by something right out of Hollywood and it terrifies you. What do you do if something like that happens? Is this, is this gun I have, is it going to be able to, is it going to be able to kill it? Can this thing die? Everything just analytical goes through your mind a million miles an hour. But I go up there, I point the weapon down range. And we go back slowly. We get to the truck. And we get to the truck. And we go out. And we drive back around to the cabin. Well, we take the main road back out to the cabin. So it's about a two and a half mile drive. And we're sitting there in silence for a little bit. Just pure silence. And, you know, I'm the goofy one. I'm really goofy. I can't take nothing serious. I work in corrections and I can't be serious. But I was quiet. He was quiet. And he's very stern. He's very serious. And out of nowhere, he breaks the silence first. He goes, Shadow, was that a werewolf? And I kind of chuckled, you know, because it's my job. That's what I am. I'm the. I'm the icebreaker. I got, I got to set the tone. I got to make everything funny again, but I couldn't. I just, it was just kind of a nervous laugh. And I said, well, it sure as heck looked like one. Didn't it? And, uh, he goes, well, werewolves ain't real. I said, well, no, they're not. And he said, well, what's that? I said, but this is the Jack Fort mountains. <laughs> There's no telling what's been left alone out here. And that's when he said, well, let's kill it. And I said, what? He said, we've hunted everything there is out here. 
he said, this is our land. This is where we spend our time. Nothing like that's going to come out here and scare us off. He said, let's take it down. And I said, I don't even know if that thing can be taken down. He said, well, we'll call our two other buddies. We'll tell them we saw a bear. We'll get them out here. And we'll go find it. <laughs> and I said, I just, at that moment, I just, I was still in shock. And there was two things that was wrong with this plan. First of all, we had to kind of not lie, but, you know, goof to our two friends to get them out there. Which once they got out there, we told them the absolute truth. The other problem with the plan was he wanted to hunt this thing at night. Because it was, you know, it was going to be dark decently soon. And it would take them almost two hours to get out there. Now, when you're 23-year-old kids, once the fear goes away and the adrenaline starts going, you know, as they say, young, dumb, and full of, you know what, you start getting excited. You're like, okay, this is our time. Go time. We're in this. We can't be messed with. We're going to show us what's boss. But it's dark. Something like this has probably lived in the woods its whole life. And I imagine it probably sees pretty well at nighttime. Well, believe it or not, as humans, we don't see the best in the dark unless we have lights. And we can't light up every single area (laughs) at once. So I just, I knew something was going to go crazy. But once our two friends got out there, we told them. We told them straight up everything. And one of them was a little skeptical. But the other one looked at me and he stared. He had the most knowing eyes I've ever seen. And you talk about Hunter. He is the definition of a hunter. He has traveled the United States hunting. And he's my age, but he went all over. He's been in hunting competitions. He's been in archery competitions, rifle competitions. And he just looked at me. And at that moment, I knew he's seen something like this before. Because he didn't doubt a word we said. And as we were gearing up, you know, we got the Can-Am ready, which if people don't know what a Can-Am is, it's a UTV, kind of like a big four-wheeler that, you know, holds more people, has a top on it, drives a little better. We had got some bigger guns. I had switched to a 4570. It's a very, very powerful round at a shorter distance. It's a rifle shell. But it's a very, very, it's a powerhouse at short distances. You ain't going to reach out and touch nothing with it. But 100 yards in, I mean, you should see what it would do to a deer. It's a powerful shell. And I had a 4570. And my buddy had taken my AR-10, which was a 308 round. It was a very, very powerful shell. Good stopping power. My other two friends had a 30 6 and the hunter, he had a forty-five seventy as well. Well, as we're getting ready to get on the Can-Am, the sun was already going down. And that's where on the field in the distance, we start hearing coyotes. And usually, you know, you hear the coyotes when they're hunting rabbits or when they're being crazy or whatever they're doing, you know, playing cards. I don't know what coyotes do all the time, but... They were, it was insane because they were in a fight with something and they were losing. I mean, it just, it was just the most Lord awful screams. And we just got in the can am and we sped down there. But once we get down there, you just you can't really see anything because the sun's starting to go down and it's just barely peaking. But we start spotlighting and there was just, Probably five, six, seven coyotes, and they were just the only appropriate term for this is slaughtered. They were slaughtered. They were torn in pieces. I don't know what they made mad, but they were tore up. One looked like it had jumped and something caught it in midair and accordioned it. And 
it was just that site was nuts. It's absolute nuts. Well, we get in the Can Am, we start taking some of them trails, and we're spotlighting these trails, we're lighting them up, looking in the trees and stuff, and the whole time you just have this feeling. I'm a firm believer. I'm not superstitious, but I'm a firm believer that every creature has a sense that allows it to know that something's watching on my, I feel like we have it as humans. I feel like that's why you set up in the middle of the night. I feel like, you know, if someone's staring at you or something is staring at you. And that whole time that we rode around, I felt that I felt like something was watching us. Like I just, I just, there's a certain moment when you just know that the hunter is no longer hunting, but being hunted. And that's the feeling I had. But the craziest part of this is when we turned back and we got back to the field, every one of those bodies was gone. There was not one dead coyote anywhere, just spots of blood. Maybe an entrail here or there. Other than that, nothing. And that was the end of that one. We went back up to the cabin. We packed up. We went back to town. And we kind of debriefed. And they didn't see it, but they saw them coyotes. But my buddy and I, we saw what we saw. And we didn't think nothing of it. You know, we were obviously scared, but. We we're still, you know, just we we're going to try going a merry way. Well, November rocks around and it's the first. It's getting ready to be the first day of deer season with rifles. And he calls me up and says, you want to go out there? You're going to go hunt deer because his Jack Ford has some great deer. And I go, yeah, let's go. And we go out there the day before so we can play video games. And then we're already there and we get up the next morning and we hunt. And being November, it gets dark earlier. And it was probably, I would say, 20, 30 minutes before good darkness. I had to use the restroom. Well, the cabin does not have running water. So you have to go outside and use the restroom. Well, I go to the right side of the cabin to use the restroom. And as I'm using the restroom, I'm finishing up and I look up and I look across the hog pasture. And sure as heck, right there at the edge of the hog pasture, standing there in the woods, this creature. And it was staring me down. First of all, that was awkward, you know, using the restroom, knowing that thing was staring at you. Talk about feeling vulnerable. But the crazy thing about it is, is inside the cabin, there's a single window that looks straight out towards the hog pasture, right where I was looking. I didn't say anything. I just came back in, sat down, grabbed the PlayStation controller, got ready to keep playing. And that's when my buddy laughed. He said, I'm getting a deer tomorrow. That fairy tale sucker is not going to stop me from getting a deer. He can come sit in a deer stand with me for all I care. And we just laughed. And see, I'm a lazy hunter. I'm as lazy as it comes. I do everything lazy, I'll admit it. I get up in the afternoon, I sleep in, and I romp around the woods. Sometimes I get something and sometimes I don't. My buddy, though, he's real gun ho He gets up before it gets daylight, and he gets to his spot. And he makes sure, you know, that he's ready. So if anything walks by right there as the daylight's hitting, it's his. And he has harvested some beautiful deer throughout the years doing that. Now, his deer stand, to put into perspective, is right in the center of the field. And it is not your prototypical deer stand. It sits on the ground. There's a giant cedar tree that's right there in the middle of the field that he hollowed out. He cut the limbs off of it, 
put him a chair on the inside, and then put the limbs stacked back. So it looks almost natural. You'd never think if you walked by unless you're staring at it. And that was actually his stand for several years. Well, I'm asleep, and I get woken up to boom. 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 And I just sat straight up. I'm like, what is going on? What is he doing down there? And he was hunting with a 30-30, which if you don't know, a 30-30 is a lever action rifle where it's the old cowboy gun. You shoot it, you cock the lever, you shoot it, you cock the lever, ejects the shell, and you keep shooting. You can fire it pretty quick, but you know, you know, laws, you know, when you hunt deer, laws and stuff, you can only have a certain amount of shells in it. So he just had the he just had the legal three shells, you know, one in and then two in the magazine. So I'm like, what is he doing? Is he is he just that inaccurate? Is he is he sl- half asleep? Is he's real accurate with a gun? <laughs> I'm, I've I've been sitting in a stand with him. I've watched him hit some deer that I mean I couldn't have made a shot on. I'm pretty good shot myself. I feel like I couldn't have made some of them shots he's made. So I'm sitting there just like, what is he doing? And it didn't seem like no time. And he was just, he just basically kicked the door of that cabin in. And he said, Shadow, it's back. It crawled in the stand with me. Get your gun. You need to come see this. And I'm like, what is going on? And when he says, get your gun, we had at the time, we had a gun that he insisted we bring with us every time we went anywhere out there. It's kind of an ongoing gag, but he called it the werewolf be good gun. And it was my grandpa's 1972 Remington 870 long gun. I have T-Rex arms, so you should see me trying to carry this gun. And it shot a three and a half inch shell and I would load it buckshot slug buckshot slug and it had an eight round tube on it because the the weapon was so long she could fit quite a few shells in it and i'm already not in a good mood i'm exhausted because i wanted to sleep later i'm sitting there loading this gun on the way down i'm dropping shells picking them up putting them back in the gun i have no sense of urgency so as i'm going i said what happened He said, I was sitting there. I started hearing some rustling. And the next thing I know is I look down. I see its head in my lap. It's looking up right at me, eye to eye. I panicked and I pulled the trigger on my gun. It took off. It ran. I chased it out of the tree stand. I shot at it twice. I think I might have hit it. I'm not sure. So the best thing I can think of is that he was sitting in there and this thing got in behind the tree because this was a massive cedar tree and it crawled around. It came through and it just, I guess, got up there and it basically put its head in his lap and looked up. And uh, I, uh, I kind of woke up then. I'm like, well, maybe I need to stop fumbling around with these shells and get this gun loaded. Uh, because he wasn't lying. He was telling the truth. And when we get there, we're standing by the tree. And yeah, I said, you fired all three times, right? He said, yeah. So I think I hit it. He said, you think you hit it? He said, yes. And as we're looking, he points to where it ran away. And it was like this perfect clearing. I'm talking maybe not even four or five foot wide clearing between two trees, a perfect little path. And I see a bullet chill. Or not like the shell, but I see like where a bullet hole where it hit the tree. So I'm sitting there thinking, okay, he fires once in the air. So there's my first shell. He fires twice. He hits this tree. He fired a third time that we got a shell missing. Maybe he actually hit it. So I didn't see no bullet holes anywhere. So I'm standing by this clear, this clearing. I said, okay, you stand right here. I'm going to walk down a little bit, see if I see anything. Just be paying attention. Because you know as well as I know, this thing can take this gun from me and beat me with it. 
So I cock the shotgun as a show of force and I pull the shotgun up and I'm walking this clearing, you know, and it's starting to get daylight now. So you kind of start seeing pretty good. And as I'm walking down, I don't get too far at all. I start seeing a blood trail. I'm like, well, okay, that's pretty interesting. And I start tracking this blood trail and it gets thicker. And it gets thicker and it gets thicker and it gets thicker. I'm like, holy smoke, he hit this thing. And I get to thinking to myself, because this blood trail gets thick. I'm talking thick, thick. And I'm like, one of the main things that bleeds on a body is the head or an artery. I'm like, he hit this thing in the head. I'm about to walk up and find this thing laying there dead. And what do I do? Who do we take pictures? Of? Do we take pictures of it? Who do we call? Is the FBI going to come put us in a padded room? All this stuff is just going through my mind. But I don't find the body. I find something way scarier. As I get to the end of this blood trail, it just the blood trail stopped almost all at once. And I look down and kind of to the right, there is like a chunk of earth where earth had been mud had been just scooped up by a giant something. And then on the left side, there was a chunk of meat. And I picked this chunk of meat up and I looked in it. And sure as heck, it was the head of that 3030 shell. That thing, he hit it. All right. I don't know where he hit it. because you really couldn't tell by the little chunk of meat. That thing was smart enough to know that it was hurt. It pulled the shell out, picked up mud, and then packed its wound, I'm guessing. And my buddy actually still has the shell. We never thought at that time to send it off to anything. He still hasn't sent it off. He keeps it, you know, he keeps it locked up in storage because, you know, it's. That's something, that's something he'll tell his grandkids one day, whether they believe him or not. But that's kind of, that was the end of it. I walked back out there to him, and we walked back up to the cabin. Needless to say, we did not get a deer. We went home and got Sonic. So that was it. And then, to my knowledge, you know, because, I mean, we're, we're best friends. We do everything together. He maybe went out once a week to feed horses after that, you know, because they had horses and cows, but nothing ever, you know, he never found no bodies of nothing, anything like that. And I really didn't go back out there until 2020. That's kind of the end of it. My first encounter, the lead up to it, is as it started happening around right around the first of fall. Leaves starting to change. Animals are starting to move a whole lot more. And during fall, me and a bunch of my friends, we'd always come over to our little piece of land that we had. And I would throw parties and get out there and have a fun time with them. Well, I'd came up with a game where I would put on my ghillie suit that I used for turkey hunting. I would send them out into the woods and it'd be like a game of cat and mouse. I had to touch them without them seeing me. And I had to not be seen by them if I wanted to win. We played it several times before we started hearing this creature. We probably played it three or four times, and each time, as it got later into fall, more towards hunting season, they kept on getting the feeling that they was being watched. I told them it was just me until I started getting the feeling I was being watched, and I was right there on top of the whole group. And probably one of the last parties I had, right before rifle season opened up, because we would heard it a couple, what I'm about to describe, a couple times before. And it was close enough that it 
had made it to where I didn't want to go in the woods without a rifle. But we was playing one night, and they was in the center of a field that had a slight incline to it. And it had a sawgrass grown in it, pretty tall sawgrass. So I could crawl up through it pretty easily. I was right on top of them about to tag one of them without them even seeing me. When we heard the most blood curdling scream kind of mixed with a howl that had so much bass to it you could feel it rattling in your chest from a, about a ho- two hollers over we decided to get out of there and really we didn't go back to that part of the land at all anymore we didn't go back there during bow season the ending stages of bow season we didn't go during the uh, muzzle loading season we wanted to go or I wanted to go they all had land in the neighboring counties or up in Kentucky they could hunt. I wanted to go during rifle season. And I had this one particular spot that produced for me every single year. It always get me a decent buck or enough does to fill the freezer. If I wasn't hunting for horn, I'd hunt for meat. That's how I was raised. But this certain field, the way I'm going to describe it to you is it's got a thicket that was to the right of me, a long field that stretched out probably around 300 yards directly in front of me. The uh, field was probably about 50 yards across from thicket to thicket. And the thick to my right was just a bunch of small saplings, briar brushes, and just general stuff that you would not want to go through. No man would want to go through it unless he had a machete or something to cut a path. That is the area that I always hunted. And it was out of a tripod. And this tripod was a little bit taller than ones in the rest of the ones in the area. It was closer to 20 feet 20 to 30 feet off the ground instead of you know the 10 to 12 like most tripods that are in tennessee it was more like the ones you see in texas but i waited until the first day of rifle season i didn't go that morning because i had heard it heard whatever this creature was at the time until i saw it and figured out what it was I had heard it all morning in the area where I wanted to hunt. I heard it screaming. And that's the best way I know to describe it to you is a scream. But I had heard it all morning coming from that area. And I decided to wait until evening a couple of hours after it had uh, stopped making any noise and I couldn't hear it no more. And if I did, it was couple hollers over and i figured you know i'd be safe now during rifle season i carried my remington 270 bolt action it had a high powered scope it always done me good it was my father's rifle before he passed and when he passed it came to me i also carried his 44 magnum because we had had hogs in the area and I know how aggressive they can be because I've seen some of my friends get charged. I've been charged by one. And you need something with a pretty stout round to stop that thing in its tracks. But I had waited till probably about 2.33 o'clock that day to hit the woods. Now, I was 17 at the time. I just got my license. And I had decided to uh, go to this area that always produced for me. I had uh, gotten there and I'd walked in plenty of daylight, 
but I noticed how quiet the woods were. Most of the time when I went to that place, if I took a 22, I could have killed my limited squirrels in just a few minutes. I was so used to hearing a squirrel bark or birds chirping or something walking in there. And I'd noticed how extremely quiet it was. It was the most eerie quiet you could imagine. It was like someone just hit the mute button on the woods. But I had, uh, I'd gotten into my tripod and gotten set up. I just started doing my normal thing of doing a little preview there to see if there's been any new any new deer trails come through, any new game trails, anything. And there was nothing. It looked like that whole area of the woods was dead. Like, not even the bugs were making any noise. And for anybody that hunts during late fall, they know how bad the bugs can be for early rifle season, and especially in Tennessee where it still can get pretty warm during the day. But I was sitting there. I ain't seen nothing all evening. When I say the woods are dead, the woods are dead. There's nothing moving, nothing going on. I'm sitting there, and it's getting towards the end of legal shooting light. And anybody knows that? That's your prime time. That's your prime time for deer. It's the last 30 minutes of daylight. So I was sitting there. And I hear some noise start coming from the thicket to my right. There was, oh, it's probably about 100 to 200 yards off when I started hearing it. Because the thicket is like I described it, you know, just briar patches and small saplings all the way through. All the way to the bottom of the holler, it's like that. And... um I hear it start coming on, coming closer and closer and closer. So I get my rifle up and I got trained on that area of where I think it's going to come out. I wait for maybe another 10 minutes or so. You know, I, all, this all happened in a matter of 15, 20 minutes. But I hear it go from, you know, maybe 200 yards to 100 yards to 50 yards away from me in that thicket. And once it got probably 75 to 50 yards away, and I I could see the top of those small saplings just start whipping back and forth as it moves through it. it. I thought it was a hog. To be honest, I thought it was one of the biggest hogs of the county when I saw that. So I got trained on the area. And right before it would have entered the field, it stopped. Just completely dead stopped. There was no more sound, no more movement. And it just seemed like it disappeared. And then... Within probably 20 to 30 seconds of it, just no movement, no nothing. I could start to see something entering the field. It was low crawling. It looked like a man low crawling, like they're doing the army crawl. But it didn't look natural. It didn't look like this thing should be doing this. And as soon as it entered the field, I could see a just ginormous canine head. Like the head was way bigger for the body than what it should have been. I just remember seeing the pointed ears, the snout, long black body following it and it had like the hawks of a dog 
if you know what I'm talking about. And I sat there and watched it enter the field. It probably got about 15 yards into the field, if that. And I could see it, like, I believe every animal and every human being has a sixth sense that tells you when you're being watched. I believe every creature on this earth has that feeling. And I don't know if it felt me watching it because by that time I'd already had my scope trained on it. I had my safety off and I had my finger on the trigger. It cut its head directly towards me and I could see them amberish yellow eyes. And they weren't looking in my direction. And these eyes were huge. I mean, they they was bigger than any animal eye shine that I've ever seen in that county. I could see its eyes looking at me, not just anywhere at me, at my eyes. It knew I was there. It knew exactly what I was. And it was looking me dead in the eyes. He knew. It knew where I was. This thing, while still holding eye contact with me, started to push up off the ground. And I could see when it started pushing off off the ground, the paws or hands or whatever you want to say it had. But I could see the extremely long claws coming off of it. If I had to estimate, they was maybe three to four inches long. But whenever he, I don't know what he did, because I I remember seeing this through the scope, because I I never took him out of my scope until he was long gone. Whenever he pushed up off the ground, and I could start to hear his joints pop when he got up on two legs, he must have clenched his hands or his paws or whatever he's got. And I could see the claws just cut through the dirt like razor blades it looked like they had no problem going through that and the dirt on the piece area i was hunting because i I can tell you this from me tilling the land for deer plots and stuff like that that ground's pretty hard It, it takes a decently weighted down plow to get through that ground and this thing went through it like it was nothing He got up on the two legs, still holding eye contact with me. He lit out one of those screams. And as close as he was, it I thought he rattled my chest the first time we heard him when he scared us, scared me and my friends out of hunting during bow season on that area. He rattled my chest, like to the point where I couldn't focus. Uh, and it was almost like it put me in a state of shock. When it when I say it rattled your chest, it I'm a Civil War reenactor. And for anyone who has ever been to one, to anyone who has ever been around any sort of big gun next to it when it fires, that thud in your chest, it was like two of them at the same time. And after he lit out that screen, he took off on two legs back to my right into that thicket. And I could see him pushing the saplings back and forth as he went, but he was in a dead sprint. And no man and no nothing on two legs should be able to go through that area like that. When... I gave him probably another five minutes, five to ten minutes till I last heard him break something on his way out. I climbed down out of my tripod. Now, on the way down, I was thinking only the worst possibilities of what could have happened. I was thinking, you know, 
if when he screamed, if I pulled that trigger, would I had a, had enough time to rack my the bolt on my rifle and get another shell back into the barrel and rate a fire before he was over here and it knocked me out of my tripod because my tripod was only secured to the ground with metal rebar that we had bent and nailed into the ground. You know, I've pushed it over on accident, just leaning against it because the dirt where the tripod was sitting was more moss because it was right next to a big tree. We never hit any of the roots or nothing on the tree. It was loose dirt. But I climbed down and I'd started walking out. I had my rifle at the low ready. I had my phone flashlight on because I'd forgotten my head torch. I had my phone's flashlight on and I had it extended on the stock because I'm I'm a lefty, so my right hand had my phone as well as the stock of my rifle. And I had my rifle at the low ready. Any sound I heard, I'd automatically snap to it and I was ready to send send lead. I'd probably gotten halfway back to my vehicle, which it was just a little Chevy truck was good for me at the time the land that I was hunting was my family's land and we're we was backed up to LBL the neighboring property those people had a house and they also hunted the land they heard this creature scream and they came booking it over there to check on me. I could see their head, their headlamps coming through the field right around the time I got halfway back to my truck. They asked me what it was and if I was okay and, you know, did I fall? Because they thought it was me. They thought it was me that it fell out of the tripod or that I would cut myself, shot myself, something. I had them escort me back to my vehicle and I was trying to explain to them along the way what I had seen. And they kept on saying, oh no, it was just a coyote. It's it's uh, someone that dropped a dog. It's just one of those dogs. It's um, a wolf. Even though wolves ain't native to here. It's a... Uh, bobcat that you heard and you just imagine the rest I, I heard every bit of it trying to write off what i saw except for one of them because it was three of them that came checked on me because it was a grandfather a father and a son that came and checked on me they escort me back to my truck and we had gotten there and the father and the son was trying to write me off the grandfather, he was looking at me like, yeah, you've seen it. His eyes was big as saucers. He, he never, he said it without saying it is the best way I can put it. He said, yeah, you've seen it. I know what you're talking about. And then I'd gotten back to my truck. You know, we'd all, all unloaded our rifles once we hit my vehicle. I offered them a ride back to wherever they either had their vehicles or where they, where they want me to take them all the way back to the house. I'd offered them that because they said they was getting ready to walk back to theirs. And I told them no. I told them, you know, no, there's something in these woods that y'all don't know what it is and that y'all need to be worried about. So I made them get in the vehicle with me. And uh, I got them back, back to their vehicle safely. And then I went back home. I laid in bed. I kept on thinking, you know, what if this thing's followed me? 
I kept on having nightmares at night of those eyes because those eyes still haunt me to this day. But I'd gotten back to my my family's house at that time, and it's you know just a little single, not even a single wide. It's a trailer, and where we had it, it's on a downhill incline. We had it split up. One half of the trailer was mine. One half of the trailer was my mom's. Well, my mom and dad's, but my mom was the only one living. So we uh, we had it split. I had the side that was higher up off the ground. My side was probably eight to nine foot off the ground. Because of the incline, we had to put blocks underneath the trailer to make it level. But my, my bedroom window was probably eight to nine foot off the ground. And it probably, of course, let me, let me back up by saying this. After that night, I didn't go out there very much. I did a few times, and I, I took out every, every gun I had at my disposal and made sure they was loaded. I had went and, you know, I go check out the land. I'd find kill sites. And these kill sites were something to see. And they was whitetail deer, wild hogs, coyotes. And I've seen animals kill sites before. But these hit me as strange in the way that they was done. Because, you know, a bobcat's going to go for the neck. A pack of coyotes is going to go for the heels and then the neck. Or they'll just eat, eat the animal while it's still alive. These kill sites were a whole different beast, if you will. They were mangled. I, I'd found most of the white-tailed deer kill sites that I'd found the head was completely gone. It was probably 20, 30 feet away. I found the the couple of wild hogs I found, I only found one or two that had their heads missing. Because it takes a lot to take a hog's head off. And then the coyotes, I'd find whole packs, whether it be at their den or out in a field, just massacred. And when I say massacred, their intestines were hanging out, legs ripped off, heads twisted around backwards, heads completely took off. One of the deer kills that I found, like I said, it was missing their head. But the thing that hit me as extremely odd was one of its legs was missing. And it wasn't cut off. It was pulled off and it seemed like in one fell swoop. Because you could literally see where the muscle had been ripped apart. It wasn't it wasn't no butcher cut. Or it wasn't cut like a knife would do. It wasn't cut like any claw would, would do. It was forcibly ripped off. And you could see where the muscle tendons snapped when they was pulled so far. And, uh, you know, probably after my experience at the tripod, it's probably about a week of nonstop nightmares that I'd wake up and see them yellow. Those eyes, the best way I can describe is the eyes because the color to me is hard to explain, but they had a yellowish tint to them. And that's the best way I know how to describe it is a yellowish tint eyes looking in my window. Well, 
one night I was there at the house by myself because my mom, she was a sitter. She would sit with the elderly and she'd be gone from about the time I get home from school to around four to five in the morning, maybe even later. But I was home alone one night, probably about a week later after my tripod experience. And I got the feeling I was being watched again. And I was in my bedroom. And like I said, my bedroom window is probably eight to nine foot off the ground. I forgot what I was doing. I think I was sitting there playing my PlayStation or something. But I look over my shoulder and I see them eyes just peering at me through my window. Of course, I freak out. And I went to the center of the trailer because it had no windows. The only two sides of the trailer that had windows was my room, the little guest room that was on my side of the trailer, and then in my mom's room. There was none in the living room. And the living room was set up as coming from my side of the trailer. It was the living room, my dad's gun cabinet, which had become mine at that time, and then the kitchen. And the kitchen had one right above the sink. I had a uh, window right above the sink. So I went in there, and all three, I had three dogs at the time. A Jack Russell, his name was Pistol. You know, he he had little dog syndrome. You know, he thinks he's 10 foot tall and bulletproof. Ain't nothing going to hurt him. Ain't nothing going to stop him. And he can tear up anything. We had uh, Sugar. She was a feist. And then we had Kipper. She was the combination of the two. And Pistol and Kipper had little dog syndrome. Like, like I explained, they think they're 10 foot tall and bulletproof. And all three of the dogs was hiding under the couch. So once I went in there, I went to my gun cabinet. I'd gotten all the guns out. I had my 270, my 12 gauge, which was loaded with buckshot, a uh, my dad's 44 magnum, a MP5 that was in 22 caliber. I can't remember the exact model name right now. Saved my life, but the best way I described it, it looks like an MP5, but it's 22 caliber and it had a 30 round clip that was full. And it had a red dot. So I was sitting there on the couch and I could halfway hear it circling the trailer. But once I'd sat in the living room, Pistol, the Jack Russell, he came out from my couch and got up there beside me. And I could tell wherever this thing was because he would turn his head or orient his body so he could know where it was and this went on for a good little while every now and then i could hear it probably every 15 20 minutes i could hear it either brush up against the house or if it was by a window sit there and almost like it was tapping on the side of it trying to draw me to it and of course you know 17 years old you're seeing something you don't know what it is you don't know what's capable of You've seen it once before. You see how fast it can move. You know your dad's warnings of being in the house before dark. And you found kill sites of something that you can't explain. So you're sitting at that time. I was sitting there thinking, okay, do not go towards that window. Because if it snatches you at that window, it's more than likely going to rip you to pieces, come in and kill the dogs and probably be waiting on your mom when she gets home from work. So I sat there and it, it, I forgot how long it circled that, that house. I mean, I, I sat up for a good little while, even after it left. And, um, uh, I, I never really wanted 
to be run off that place. But once my mom had come home, she could tell something was up. I told her what was up, and it wasn't too long after that that we was moved. We would left that land. We would moved to the center of Dover, and we just wanted to be left alone. We didn't want nothing to do with this creature. And other than those two on that land, I've only had one other encounter with this, and it's nowhere near as blood pumping or heart racing or adrenaline driven. But I was 18 at this time, so probably about five, six months had passed. I went and picked up two of my best friends. Now, two of my best friends, well, at that point, I was still in high school. You know, I'd been best friends with these two girls for a very long time. And they wanted to go right through LBL. So I picked them up. Neither one of them are from around here. So they wanted to know, you know, is there any spooky stories from here or any myths, legend, cryptid, stuff like that? Because they was very big into that. They loved exploring abandoned places. They loved the spiritual, the paranormal, cryptids and stuff like that. They was eat up with it. I told them about the murders and the people going missing and especially the legend of the beast of LBL, which is the one that people credit with the family being murdered that I told you about that I'd mentioned at the beginning of this recording. They wanted to know more about it. You know, have I ever seen it? Stuff like that. And I, I just kind of pushed it off because I didn't want to tell them what I'd seen, but they wanted to go to the Kentucky side of land between the lakes because they wanted to go to a place called Hotel California. They wanted to go there. I want to take them to the Elk and Bison Prairie, if I'm being honest with you. But we had gotten probably about halfway there, and we noticed it was starting to get later in the day, and I didn't want them to be out there at night for multiple reasons. So I knew LBO pretty good. So I took a road that uh would circle us close to the Kentucky side of LBL and then lead us back down through some back roads back into our little town. I was telling them the story about it again because they wanted to know all they could about it. So we was going, I just finished the story. And I start getting that just got off feeling of something ain't right. I feel like I'm being watched again. So I look in my rear view mirrors and it's sun's going down, but it's still plenty daylight to see. I look directly back and crossing the road is a very big, a very strong looking creature with a canine head on two legs, pointed ears, the eyes, and it's going across the road behind my vehicle. And I step on it. I go from probably going around 40 down the back roads to going 60 to 70. And they think I'm just trying to show off and, you know, mess with them like I normally did. And, you know, we're sitting there laughing, cutting, joking, and joking. And they ask me, because they see my face and it's just ain't straight, even though I'm sitting there still trying to laugh with them. They say, okay, what did you see? Something ain't right. What's going on? And, uh, I didn't tell him. We get to this town and I ask, okay, what's up? We're not stupid. You're our best friend, so tell us. So eventually I, I crack and tell him. 
I told him, you remember that story about the family got murdered by that creature? I'm pretty sure I just saw the portrayer. And of course, with them being eat up with the paranormal and cryptid hunting and all that, they wanted me to turn around to go see if there's any tracks or anything like that. And I told them, no, I'm not going back. And then I told them my experiences I had before. I told them, look, there's nothing y'all can do to make me go back. Well, we went back into town and I dropped them off. Of course, they was still a little bummed. And I went back home. And other than hearing the screams every now and then when I go to LBL, that was the last time I had an encounter where I saw it. But till probably till the day I die, when it gets real late at night, if I can't sleep and I'm out on my porch, I'm probably always going to think of them eyes. Especially when it gets quiet. I'm probably always going to think of them eyes and start thinking when it gets quiet. Where the eyes going to pop up now. Back in January of 2009, I had gone coon hunting with my three best friends who two of them happened to be my cousins. I was actually not supposed to be coon hunting that night. I had uh, gotten into some trouble at school and I was grounded. So my parents told me, you know, I don't want you going anywhere tonight. You know, you're, you've in trouble and you you know, you need to learn something. Well, me being 12, I decided well, I don't want to just sit here. It's a, it's a full moon night, man. We want to go coon hunting. So the boys, they, you know, they give me a holler and, I said, all right, you guys, I'll, I'll meet you down at the corner of our road at about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Okay, we'll let it get good and dark. We'll let the parents go to bed. So I climb out my window with a 410 shotgun. It's a single shot, Rosie. It's a change out. You could take the barrel off and put on a 22. So I had the 410 on there and I had a bag loaded with shells. Like I could have started a 410 war. I had so many shells on me, but I was expecting to get a lot of coons. So I go trucking down the road at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night and I meet the guys and, you know, they got their two walker hounds in the back of the truck in the dog boxes. And Clayton, who's one of our friends, he had the dogs. He's like, all right, man, you ready to go? I think we're going to go up there by the tall pines tonight. And that's about seven miles from the house, eight miles from the house as the crow flies. So we're all in there. Garrett's driving. It's his truck. He's 16. Matt, his younger brother, he's 14. I'm 12. Clayton's also 14. And we, you know, we all just kind of grew up in the same area and we all ran around and raised cane together. So we're going down the road and we get there and we start hunting, turn the dogs loose instantly on a coon. And we're running these coons left and right. And we finally work our way about five miles back south in the tall pines. And, you know, we get a mess of coons. I think we had like 12 by then. So we bring them back to the truck. And we put them in the bag and it's like, man, you know, it's, it's only about 1230, you know, we ain't even been out here for an hour and a half yet. And we're already loaded with coons. Well, I think it was Matt. He had the brilliant idea of going hunting to the North. And if you go North into the tall pines, what'll happen is four miles in, you'll hit a draw. And about 20 yards beyond that, you go down into a valley that's got a lake in it. We never hunted around by that lake and we never ever got as far as the draw because half the time there wasn't coons. Well, he wanted to go hunt it. So we kind of meandered that way. We walked the four miles. Again, we're loaded with coons. I probably had about three of them and it was getting kind of deep. You know, we had about a foot and a half of snow on the ground at the time. So Garrett, he's about six foot at the time. I hand him my stuff because I'm only five, three and Shoot, I'm waddling through the snow at this point. So I hand them my coons and we're walking. And the dogs take off and we're getting close to this draw. And they take off. They're on a hot street. Well, Clayton's up in front because it's his dogs. I'm following behind Clayton. And I got Matt and Garrett kind of walking side by side behind me. And we're going. And we get about 20 yards from this draw. And we're just, you know, we're walking up on it because the dogs, they dip down in there. 
As soon as they dipped down in there, everything went dead silent. 20 seconds later, we have two walker hounds, Amos and Russ, come screaming out of that draw. Now, these dogs aren't scared of nothing. These dogs have treed black bear. They've treed bobcat. These dogs, they're big dogs. These aren't your normal black and tan coon hounds or your blue tick coons. These are big dogs. People use these walker hounds to hunt cougar out west to get them off of cattle ranches. So these dogs, you know, they're not scared of nothing. But these dogs, they come flying out and they're screaming. And we're like, what in the heck are they screaming about? Well, not even five seconds after they pop out of the draw running towards us and go flying through the truck. That's when we see this thing come up out of the other side. And at this time, from the other side of the draw is only 25 yards away. And what I saw that night forever haunts me at this point. Because it came up over the draw on two legs. I'd say it was probably about 400, 450 pounds. Shoot, it might have even been 500. I'd estimate the height. Oh, shoot, no. I was about eight foot tall because the rock it was next to was about six feet. And it was two feet over the rock. But this this thing that I didn't even know existed, I didn't have any clue. It comes walking up on the other side of the draw and it turns and it looks at us. And when it squared off on us, this thing had to have been at least four feet wide. It was like a chocolate gold brown in color, really dark, and it had a really wide head. Like you take a grizzly bear's head, how it's got that really wide set, and you slap some Doberman ears on it, and you give it that longer wolf snout. And when it opened its mouth, I forgot to tell Vic about this in the pre-interview, but this thing which saw us, man, it, it gave a growl. And when I say this growl rattled your insides, it rattled your insides. Well, it's looking at us and its fingers are flaring and we can see the claws. Well, when I tell you Clayton didn't hang around much longer than that, Clayton was gone. And, uh, well, I guess he just kind of didn't realize I was there. And I actually, when I talked to him about it, he says, yeah, I didn't see you. But he plowed me over because I was right behind him. He run me clean over. So I'm down butt first in the snow. My gun goes flying. He's hauling for the truck, screaming, oh, my God. And then Matt and, Gar- Matt and Garrett, next thing I know, I turn around and I look and then they're turning tail and running too. They're chasing the dogs. They're running after Clayton. And I'm just sitting there on the ground with my gun in the snow thinking they left me. I turn around and I look at this thing and this thing has gone from looking at my buddies running away from it to me sitting butt first in the snow at 25 yards, my gun laying in the snow. And I'm just sitting there petrified and it, it turned all attention on me. And this thing wasn't looking at me. It was looking through me. And, uh, it had a look on it. Like if I want to kill you, I can, man. It, it gave me the look like I was dead. I freaked out. And the only thing I could think to do was run. I grabbed the hold of that gun and I spun out of the snow and I took off running. And I mean, I ran and it's four miles back to the truck. Well, I'm hauling Heine and it's, 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 it takes you a bit going four miles through a foot of snow and I'm going as fast as my legs can take me. And I swear to you the entire time I was running until I got about a mile from the truck when I could see the truck. I could hear snow crunching behind me. I knew this thing was coming. I knew it was coming. I knew it was behind me. I knew if I stopped and turned around, I was done. But I just, I kept running. I finally see the truck and there's, it's a three seat truck. All four of us rode in the front. I only see two people in the front. Well, they had the window rolled down and they're screaming, get in, get in. It's there. Get in. So I dove in the window, man. Didn't even bother unloading the gun. Nothing. I just boom, jumped right through the window. 
And I land right in the center of the seat. I flip around. And I said, get me out of here. So we get that cut truck going and we turn ourselves around and we floor it. And then it hits me. Well, where's Matt? Garrett flat out looked at me and he says, he's in the dog box with the dogs. Well, apparently they couldn't get the truck doors open fast enough. And Matt said, heck it. And he jumped in the dog box. I learned about that too over the weekend. So we're, you know, we're driving off and they get down to the edge of my road because Garrett's truck's loud. Like it, it would wake a dead man. And there, you know, we pull off into there and we're kind of sitting there talking and nobody really wants to talk about it. Matt climbs out of the dog box and gets up in the front. And now I've got to walk a quarter of a mile up my road. That's dark because I'm in the middle of sticks. But I got to walk a quarter of a mile up my road back to my house and crawl back in my window without the yard light going on. You know, not to alert my parents. So I climb back and out of the truck and say, all right, you guys, I'll see y'all tomorrow. Small Saturday. See y'all, you know, see y'all in the morning. Meet me at my barn. Well, you know, we're all, we, we got to talk about this. So I make it back into my house and I'm sitting there and my German shepherd that I had at the time, Shadow, she's just laying there on my bed, looking at me like you idiot. She could tell I was scared. Well, I crawl in bed and I don't think I slept at all that night. Next morning, 10 o'clock, all the boys come over. We're all hanging out in my barn. That's got hay in it. It's January. It's cold. So we start talking about it. And Garrett says, anybody have a clue what we saw out there? I want to hear what you guys saw before I tell you what I saw. And they all described it. And the variation of descriptions didn't, it didn't happen. We all described the same thing. Eight feet tall, four foot wide, over 400 pounds, muscled all the way through. They said, but what got us, man, is it's, it's, it had hands. And I said, yeah, I thought I had hands, but I was trying to tell myself it didn't have hands. But it had hands. But the eyes, honestly, are what stuck out in all four of our minds was the eyes. The eyes were brownish gold. Now, my eyes tend to be about that color. It depends on what mood I'm in. Sometimes they're more gold. Sometimes they're more of a deep brown. But this thing had like a golden reflection in the back of its eye. Must be for light. But Garrett looked right at me and he said, the scariest part was, Kai, is it had your eyes. And that's what flipped us all out. <laughs> then the question came up again. Well, what the heck was it? Well, Clayton, being 100% Cherokee, flat out said, oh, it's a skinwalker. It's a skinwalker. It's a shifter. You know, it's we did, we, did we, met, we ran into something there that we don't need to mess with no more. Well, Matt and Garrett, they said, well, it kind of looked like a werewolf. And as I said, being a Disney kid, I didn't know what it was. I'd never seen a werewolf movie. I didn't know what a werewolf was. I mean, I heard of them, but I didn't know what they looked like. I'm saying, so that's what that's, that's what that was. Is a werewolf. They said, yeah, it's a werewolf. I said, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't think they're supposed to be real. Well, apparently they were. Garrett looked at all three of us because between me and Matt, we were called Eminem for a reason. We were motor mouth kids. We just, we start talking. We don't stop. We'll talk to Blue Street. But he looked right at me and Matt. He said, you guys don't say a word to nobody. We ain't telling our parents. We ain't saying nothing. If they asked us if we went hunting, yeah, we went hunting. How good was the night? Good night. Got a lot of coons. But we're not saying anything about this. And we left it at that. So about a year goes by, just about, not quite. We were in the next school year. I was in seventh grade. And uh, our teacher, we had, you know, half the class was off on a field trip. And we were the kids that got in trouble too much. So we didn't get to go. Teacher says, all right, you guys, close to Halloween. It's October. Anybody got any scary stories or true stories like ghost stories you all want to tell? Well, one of my cousins, you know, they're talking and she says she saw a Bigfoot, which I don't doubt her. And then I said, all right, well, you know, I'll bring up my story. And I told him. And when I say everybody in that classroom laughed at me and said, oh, I was just seeing things. I said, no, I'm not. Well, you, you just you watch too many werewolf movies. I said, I've never seen a werewolf movie. I am watching Disney movies. I don't watch. 
werewolf movies. I don't watch scary movies. I don't. I don't like them. They freak me out. And they're all sitting there laughing at me and the bell rings and, you know, they're all going out of class laughing. And, you know, I'm about ready to ball. My teacher looks at me and she says, well, you probably saw something, but it's probably not what you saw. If, uh, if I were you, you little kid, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say anything about that again to anybody. Um, don't go talking about that. People already call you the crazy woman and the wild woman of the woods. They, you know, we don't give them another reason to make fun of you. I was, I was a bullied kid. So after that, I didn't, I didn't say a darn thing. I completely suppressed it. I said, man, if just talking about it is going to get me laughed at, then there's no point. And I completely shoved it in the back of my head. I never talked about it again. I forgot about it. And in the meantime, Garrett and Matt, they moved back down to Arizona with some of their family, uh, back on towards the res. Clayton and his family, they moved to Florida. I don't honestly, Clayton never hunted coons again. And uh, Matt and Garrett are like me. They don't go outside at night. So years go on, about nine years pass, you know, never had another incident, put it in the back of my head. At this time, though, I'm kind of kind of getting more into Bigfoot, you know, it's a possibility and thinking how kind of cool it would be. Well, September rolls around of 2018, and this was 2018, man, that was a good year. I was having a good year in the rodeo, me and my horse, you know, Justice, good old boy, we were doing great. And we were out, you know, running a eight mile stretch for some endurance training. It's just some, you know, fun time. So I don't sour him out on the barrels. At this time, I had Smokey, my big boy. He was just a little pup. Well, not really little if you want to call it 89 pounds little, but to me, he was little. And we're going down and we're about, again, about eight miles from home as the crow flies. And we're sitting up there on the top of this hill. And we're just kind of looking over this cow pasture, just kind of enjoying it, you know, taking a good breather. The dog's tired. I'm tired. The horse is a little tired. We got a ways to go home. So we're sitting there. And next thing I know, Smokey's looking towards the field. And his ears are direct forward. And he went flat to the ground. Like laid completely flat to the ground, as flat as he could get. I mean, I thought he was just going to dig a hole and bury himself. That's how he looked. And then I noticed Justice's ears had flipped forward, and they were locked onto a target, and every muscle in his body tensed up. Now, what Justice is, he is a 13-hand Kiger Mustang, and he's a dark bay. Beautiful boy, smart boy. I've tracked bear on him. I've tracked cougar. I've tracked coyote. I've hunted off of him. I've gone deer hunting with him. There's nothing that scares this horse. All of my animals are this way. There's nothing that scares them. So when my horse is tensing up and my dog is laying down, I know something's up. So I'm thinking, all right, well, maybe it's just one of these big bear. It's coming out. And I'm looking and sure enough, I see this black nose stick out. I'm like, oh, cool, man. That's a bear. And it's only 75 yards. I can get a good look at this sucker. And it comes walking out and it's just, it ain't looking right. That ain't no bear. The head's too big. Ears are too tall. And it's just, it's the body's just, it's still coming. Holy smokes. This thing's still coming. And before I know it, I literally am looking at a wolf like creature that's standing probably four and a half to five feet at the shoulder on all fours coming across this field. And it was black, man. It was blacker than black. Like you take the darkest night, middle of winter, no moon, and you make it 10 times darker. It was that dark. Sunlight was shining on it and it wasn't even, it wasn't even reflecting on it. No, you know, a bear, you get light on a bear's fur and it'll reflect. Sometimes it'll reflect blue. Well, this had no skin reflection whatsoever no hair reflection whatsoever it was just just black like it just absorbed all that light and uh my horse is standing there tense to holy godness i'm sitting there shaking like a leaf the dog's laying flat on the ground and this thing's just cruising through the field like no care in the world 
at the time I'm sitting here thinking, oh my God, don't let it see me. Oh my God, don't let it see me. Well, I'm pretty sure it knew we were there, but I guarantee you it didn't care. And it just kept right on going. Went from east or west to east all the way across that 75 acre. It was about a 75 acre field, but that's the long ways to it. It was probably only about three acres wide. And it crossed that three acre field in about 20 seconds. And that was just at a casual walk. But it, it clearly had a MO to go for the end. And when it went out of sight and we didn't hear it moving and, you know, we didn't, the horse wasn't reacting, the dog wasn't reacting, we spun around and we beat feet all the way back home. We made what should have been about a three hour run. We made it home in 30 minutes. And I'll, a three hour, you know, good trot on a horse and making it home in 30 minutes, that's hauling. I guarantee you, man, that dog was going flat out. There was a few times we actually had to stop for the dog just to let him catch up. That Mustang, he didn't want to stop. He didn't want to stop. I didn't want to stop. That dog sure as heck wasn't going to stop. We'd stop, wait for him. He'd blow right past us. We got home. I put the horse up, you know, kind of cooled him down some, put him in a good spot where he had some air but wouldn't get too cold. Dogs laying on the ground, little tongue lolling, ready to pass out. And uh, I'm shaking like a leaf. I just sat down. I took the tack and stuff off the horse. I sat it right on the ground. Normally, I'm a little bit more picky with my stuff, but I just, I just put it right on the ground. I didn't care. And I just sat there for a good hour just shaking. Absolutely shaking. And even then, when I saw that one, I didn't even remember seeing that one at, at 12. I didn't even remember seeing that one at all. It was like a rude awakening of, oh, my God, what did I just see? And it was just, I sat there and I was trying to figure out what was I looking at. But it's like the shoulders were higher up than the back end. And this thing was thick. Like, it wasn't like anything like what people like to describe Dogman as. It's not like, you know, some of these pictures that Vic has on his YouTube. This thing was thick. Like, this sucker was eating good, man. Like, if there was cows or something coming up missing around my place, around this area, I guarantee you it was because that thing was eating them. Now, that happened about eight miles as the crow flies from the house. But I guarantee you, eight miles is nothing to these things. That sucker could be in my backyard. Even the one that I saw up coon hunting, that one could be here. I know they weren't the same animal because they're the different colors. But these things, I guarantee you, travel. But kind of after that, you know, that's when my Bigfoot sighting started kicking up. And that's when all that happened. And after talking to Vic, I actually think that there was a third encounter. And judging by a track I found, I'm pretty sure it was of the type three dog man where they are more of like a man with a dog head. That encounter is actually in and of itself scarier because I never saw it, but just the circumstances behind it. And what was crazy is my dad was literally hunting. We were hunting deer. It was about December and we were hunting deer and he was only about 200 yards from where I was at in his blind. And he said he didn't hear a thing. He didn't see a thing. He says, all I saw was your heater light come on. That's all I saw. But man, when I tell you I was scared then, that that scared's an understatement. So I'm walking out, and it's about a half a mile on my grandma's property out to where we hunt. And I'm walking out. I got a half a mile all the way to that blind. Dad's is about quarter, well, just over a quarter of a mile. It's right in between them. So his blind's about 200 yards from mine. And I crawl up in my blind, you know, thinking, oh, yeah, it's going to be a good day. But I still had that really off feeling, you know, like when you walk in the woods and it's just something's not right. Well, that's kind of how it felt. And I get in my blind and the dimensions on this blind is it's a solid metal blind. It's literally built on a piece of plywood. So it's four foot wide, eight foot long. I got a hole in one side of it that's only about two feet wide, and that's our door. And getting into that, it makes some god-awful noises, especially when it's metal and it's catching on fabric. 
so it makes some good racket. So if there's deer in the clearing, they're going to hear about it. So I get up in there and I'm hunting with a 308, 168 grain black coat tip, 30 cal round out of a 308 rifle. So I hunt with a 600 model 600 uh, Remington. So it's a very short stock or brush guns. And I'm in there and I'm hunting. And I've got about 150 yards shooting power when you're shooting a lighter round. I'm not even in this blind for five minutes. And all of a sudden, the brush explodes like something's going through there with a bulldozer. And it's going back and forth, back and forth. And it's getting closer. There's a couple of times that I could have swore I saw something rush right past my blind. Now, I'm scared out of my mind. Normally, I won't turn my heater on because it's loud. I won't turn it on because I want to hear stuff waking up in the morning. Well, at that time, I was so desperate for light, I turned on my propane heater. I moved my chair up into one corner where I'm staring at the door, and I'm praying the entire time. Now, my rifle holds. It's a four plus one, so it's got four in the mag, and it's got one in the chamber. We always load up with five shots. So I'm sitting there, and it's like, man, you know, I'm looking at this door. It, whatever's out there sounds big. It ain't going to come in the windows because the windows are only six inches. But that door's big enough. Something might try. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, I've got, I've got four shots to put into whatever tries to come in. And if it don't go down in four shots, then I better keep this last one for me because I'm not going to sit in a box and get mauled. I was fully prepared to go out in a blaze of glory. And I sat there with my back up against that wall well into daylight before I finally turned my chair around and turned my heater off and kind of sat there shaking. About noon rolls around that day and I crawl out of my blind and I walk back into the thicket behind the blind because I was going to go back around my dad and go grab my phone out of the car, but I can't walk right past him because then he'll know I'm, you know, out walking around when I shouldn't be. And what really scared me the most was that 20 feet behind my blind in the thicket I saw this track really wide up in the front. You could clearly see the five toes, but they had like a claw on them. And then the heel came back really narrow, really narrow heel. And it all, it didn't come off to one side or the other. It was like straight in the center of the whole track, just big print and then zoop, straight back. And that track was about 12 inches, maybe 14 inches long. And my foot, you know, I... I, I classify myself as a big foot because, you know, I, I wear size 10 in women's, but, um, you know, I've, I got a fairly large foot and it's fairly wide. My foot came nowhere near close to the size of this. And that's when it hit me because I'm looking right at my blind. I'm looking at this track and it's like, man, this thing was a little too close for comfort. So, you know, that was about all for the dog, man. Really, until last week on Sunday. Well, not this past Sunday, but, you know, the Sunday before. I had already talked to Vic. We were getting ready to do the uh, interview for my Bigfoot sightings. And I was hanging out in my kitchen. My husband was up at my parents' place taking a shower because we don't have running water over here. And I'm sitting there and I'm singing, you know, I'm singing in, in Nordic because I, I know several different languages and I love singing in them because they're beautiful. And I'm sitting here singing and I notice my dog is nowhere near my door. He's laying right smack dag in the mid middle of my kitchen. And I've got a small kitchen. Our house isn't very big. It's only 12 foot by 20 foot. It's, it's small. Like if something really wanted to come in, I've actually pushed on my door hard enough where I almost pushed it out of the frame. But it really wouldn't take much for something to come through my walls like the Kool-Aid man and go, oh, yeah, and it'd be over. But he's nowhere near the door. And it's unlocked, you know, because my husband's supposed to be coming back anytime. And I look at the window and I just see this gray head looking at me right at the corner of my window. And I can see these two dark eyes. And it's almost like this thing smiling at me. But he was kind of squinting. He had, had this really fluffy gray head with the Doberman straight up ears and little tufts on the end. And he's just looking at me. Well, no doubt in my mind, I ain't going to sit there and go, what the heck? is? I already knew what it was. I'm looking at my unlocked door. I can't lock it because I don't want my husband, you know, getting stuck outside with this thing. My yard light's on. This thing's standing here. I just 
blew it off and I went upstairs. Cause I knew if I got afraid and I acted afraid and I ran upstairs that it was probably, you know, going to get a razz and who knows, maybe come in my house and see if it can get more of a razz. Well, I just went upstairs and I sat up there and I waited not even three minutes later, my husband walks out and I'm sitting there thinking, man, please let this thing be gone. Please don't let this thing be waiting on this porch. Don't, don't let it be here, but it was gone. And it hasn't really come back and that I'm glad for, but it seems like no matter what I do now, these things keep coming back and they're always around. So I've just kind of got to accept the fact that I'm not just in Sasquatch territory. I'm in Dogman territory and these things are here and they ain't going to go anywhere because when the Bigfoot leave for deer season, the Dogman comes walking right in because we're in October now. Sasquatch, they've gone down into the swamps because they, you know, they're getting away from the hunters. Well, now it's the dogman's turn to come up here and wreak havoc. So I really don't think this is going to be the last time I see one. I don't think it's going to be the last time I see that one in particular. I'm actually sitting here looking out my dark window right now, and I've watched my yard light come on over by my outhouse twice. Come on. Could have been triggered by the horse I've got over there. I've got a mini stud that's in a high fence over there, but I don't know. It just it makes me a little jumpy and unnervy because <laughs> now all these encounters are back fresh in my mind. But those are my encounters. I pray to God I don't have any more. But, you know, the old saying goes, you can wish in one hand and crap in the other and see which one fills up first. I'm pretty sure I'll have more encounters and much as I don't want to, well, they're just, they're there. But yeah, those are, those are my encounters.